Vegetarianism started getting pushed really hard in the 1800s because of the puritanical movement and the temperance movements because they thought that the women especially shouldn't eat meat because it gave them carnal desires. You eat of the flesh, you'll think of the flesh and, and no, can't have that. You know, can't have people reproducing and being healthy and fertile. Nope, nope, nope. We need to suppress that. And so the idea was if you were a virtuous person, you would go vegetarian to suppress your sexual urges. In any experiment, any model, and any observation in nature, when animals stop being interested in mating and reproduction, they are sick. There is something wrong. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for joining my live session today. Uh, very sorry that we had to sort of delay a bit of the times. We just had some appointments this morning that, that ran late. So I apologize for that. Thank you, everyone who's still here and people that are joining in. And sorry for the people on the East Coast of the US because it's pretty late now and probably won't be able to, to get much of it. Uh, so I apologize for that. But hopefully you'll be able to, to catch the replay. Um, I had some uh, chats and questions and super chats from earlier that I'm still going to try to get to. Uh, now, so we'll start with them anyway, and the people can ask questions. Uh, I have about two hours today before I have to go. Uh, so that'll be uh, 1.30 p.m. my time here in Perth, 1.30 a.m. in the East Coast, so probably not too many people over there. But um, uh, we'll go for a couple hours anyway. And, uh, and hopefully catch, catch as many questions as we can. So question from Lena. Thank you for the super chat. I eat fatty meat and it stops tasting good, but I get full before meeting one gram of protein per pound of body weight since the meat is so fatty. What to do? Just keep going. Um, I, don't, I don't think that you have to uh, worry too much about that. It depends on your body's demands and what, what your body's asking for. Also, if you're eating more than once a day, that might might be a solution. So some people think that they have to eat just once a day. That's not necessarily the case, especially if you're working out, exercising, you, you will probably be hungrier than that and want to eat more times throughout the day. So just listen to your body. It, it doesn't have to be once a day. If you're finding that you can eat two decent sized meals until it stops tasting good, um, then, then do that. Um, I often find when I'm working out more and obviously my body will have a more, uh, higher demand for energy and protein at that time, then I will, then I will need to eat more than once a day. I'll eat usually twice a day. If I'm not able to do that, I can get leaner. I can get stronger, but I don't tend to get bulkier. And so you, you need, you know, more, more meat to put on meat and, when I'm able to eat enough and I'm working out, I put on muscle very, very easily, but I have to eat. I have to get enough. So you know, try eating more than once a day if you don't think you're getting enough, but I have no idea how many grams of protein I'm getting per pound of body weight. And I'm not too worried about it. You know, it, uh, it works out uh, either way. Remember that our bodies are much more complex than, than a simple equation like one gram of protein for one gram, one gram, uh, pound of body weight. You know, this is a, this is a, you know, we, we can give it some people a threshold saying, Hey, let's try to get a minimum. And, um, and that, and that has been shown to be beneficial, especially when people are under eating protein. But if your body's telling you to stop and you're doing well and you're healthy and you're lean and strong and putting on muscle, that's really the only thing uh, that you need to worry about. Otherwise, it, it's sort of a guideline to help guide people in the right direction. So at least they're not, uh, you know, really missing out on on different nutrients. But I think that if you just listen to your body, you'll be fine. And um, if you need to eat more than once a day, then that's also part of listening to your body as well. So uh, do what you can there. Uh, dropping Bear Survivor. <laughs> thanks, thanks for the super chat. Uh, any thoughts on pit drop bears for people that don't know or koalas it's supposed to drop down out of the trees and attack you and eat you. Um, but uh, apparently it survives, so that's good. So any thoughts on people with uh, ApoE3 and or 4 genes being told to avoid saturated fat? Yeah, I'd say it's nonsense. Um, it doesn't matter what your, your genetic idiosyncrasies are. You're still a human. I mean, that, that's the only genetic marker you need is are you, are you human? Um if you are, then you need to eat what humans are designed to eat, which is high fat meat. 
all animals get saturated fat by and large. So carnivores, 70% of animal species are carnivores and they eat meat, they eat meat and fat. Um, and a lot of them eat saturated fat unless you're like you know, eating fish that may have less saturated fats, but you know, sharks are eating seals that are high in saturated fats. And then obviously lions and other carnivores are eating terrestrial animals that, that are, uh, that contain the saturated fat and they get protein and saturated fat. That's what they get. And then herbivores, they break down, uh, fiber not they, but their microbes break down fiber into, and may, and may as a waste product produce saturated fat. And then those microbes die and uh, get absorbed as protein. So pretty much all animals on earth, including humans, uh, get saturated fat and protein as, as major portions of their diet. And regardless of their genetics. So you know, this is just this, this false vilification of fat and cholesterol in particular. And um, it's wrong. It's just completely backwards and wrong. Um, it's not a, it's not a supposition. You know, this was, this is the sugar companies invented the idea that cholesterol was bad for you in order to cast the blame away from their own products. So these are drug dealers, and they've always been drug dealers. This is a drug. Sugar is a drug. It is toxic to the body. It is addictive to the body. And they want to push this on people because they're drug dealers and they want to sell drugs. And that's why that you hook kids early on drugs and then you have customers for the rest of, of their lives, however short they may be. Um, so this is just, again, with the vilification of fat. You look at the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. In 2020, they looked at saturated fat and its, and its uh, association with cardiovascular disease, for one thing, uh, and they found absolutely no association between saturated fat consumption and cardiovascular disease. In fact, and they were looking at randomized controlled trials, meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials, all the top tier levels of, of, of uh, evidence, and they found absolutely no association between saturated fat and, and um, heart disease or cardiovascular disease. And in fact, they found an inverse relationship between saturated fat intake and stroke rate. So the more saturated fat people ate, the less strokes they had. The less saturated fat they ate, the more strokes they had. So we have gotten this wrong. Well, we didn't get this wrong. They lied and misrepresented the facts in order to fool us so that they could keep selling their dirty drugs to us. And, um, and that's not me saying that. That's their own words saying that published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2016, detailing how they paid off various professors from Harvard uh, and elsewhere to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol and saturated fat were the problem when it was much more likely to be sugar and processed foods. One of those professors was named head of the USDA. He was the one who authored and published the USDA declaration saying that cholesterol caused heart disease, saturated fat increased cholesterol, by all means, stop eating both. And they just started blaming everything else. And they say, oh, well, Alzheimer's is going, oof, red meat. Oh, diabetes is going, oh, red meat. Even though we've been, we've been reducing our red meat and saturated fat intake for the last 40 years by over a third. And the, these diseases are going up. Well, it must be oh, it's just too much red meat. You know, okay, we, we're eating less red meat. Not less enough. Okay, so I mean, what's, how, is it, how is it that we are that we are getting worse as saturated fat is getting lower if saturated fat is the cause. The cause and effect relationship is if you remove the cause, the effect goes away. But in fact, the effect is getting magnified when we are, are taking away this supposed cause. So APOE3, 4, LDL, C, HDL, what it doesn't matter. You know, APOB doesn't matter. These are all just shifting the goalposts and just saying, don't eat meat, don't eat fat. This is, this is propaganda um, and it's garbage. So the only genetic factors you need to worry about, are you human? Do your genes say that you're a human being? Then you should eat what a human being is supposed to eat. Lions eat what lions eat. Dolphins eat what dolphins eat. Cows eat what cows are supposed to eat. If they go outside of that, they may get hurt. Uh, I don't know of a single animal on earth that gets harmed by eating meat, though, even herbivores. You know, we see herbivores opportunistically eating smaller animals 
all the time. You just go on YouTube and, and, and look for elks eating rabbits and ducklings and birds and mice and chickens and all these sorts of things. They do it. So do horses. So do cows. Um, if they have the opportunity to, they just munch them up because that's what we need here. We need, we need protein and fat and we need the nutrients to build and develop meat. Easiest access to that is meat, another animal that has already done the hard work for us. So, uh, no, it's crap. I don't, I don't worry about any of that stuff. So any, any, anytime and it's just, just like, well, what about this and saturated fat? No. Saturated fat is what we're designed for. We're designed to eat, well, not just saturated fat, but we're designed to eat animal fats is, is more accurate. Not all of them are saturated fats, but the saturated fats in animal fats are not bad for you. So eat animals, eat animal fats. That's how you're going to be the healthiest you're going to be. And you avoid all the other things. That's how you're going to be the healthiest that you can be. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the Carnivore Market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products that will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, Behind. Check it out using my discount code Anthony to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right, thanks guys. Bloom, thank you for the super chat. Um, raw eggs is asking about. I want to add muscle, working out a lot, and consuming around 12 to 16 eggs a day. How much should I fear salmonella? Currently in Argentina, how are eggs in Latin American countries? Oh, well, that's a good that's a good question. You know, it really just depends on where you're getting them from. I don't know the rates in in uh, Argentina. Um, something that you you could probably you know search around on Google for and see what they are. You know, a lot of people do drink raw eggs. I drink raw eggs every now and then. Um, it, you do run the risk of salmonella. It's um, going to be pretty low risk, but it's real risk and you get salmonella, you'll, you'll freaking know about it. Um, if you're not drinking a lot of water as well, though, if you have very potent stomach acid, lower pH, that may offset the risk because that can kill those bugs before they set in. If you have higher pH and you're eating a whole bunch of things that buffer your stomach acid or drinking tons of water or other sorts of foods that can that can buffer that acid that's more of a risk because you're you're going to not have as hostile an environment for those bacteria in your stomach we have a very low stomach ph because our ancestors were scavengers and carnivores and they were they didn't have refrigeration outside of the ice ages probably uh, had natural freezers in the ice ages could just <laughs> put a a mammoth hunk in a snowbank and come back to it whenever you wanted. But um, in general, we had to contend with a high bacterial load. And so that's uh, that's one of the major defenses that we have is that is that hot, it's low stomach pH, high acidity. Um, so it just depends. You know, it, it, it is a risk that you run. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to recommend anyone drinks raw eggs. All I can say is that people do it and it, um, you know, and there are people that have done it safely and there are ways to do it more safely, but it is a risk. Um, and as, um, you know, as, as any sort of responsible person, I need to, you know, you know, discuss those risks quite seriously because, you know, you get a salmonella poison, you can die from that. You know, that's very serious. So I have absolutely drank raw milk or raw eggs, um, you know, sort of like a dozen at a time. It's usually when I'm just on the go and I'm like, okay, I'm on call. I'm, I'm home for 10 minutes and I'm just called right back in. I uh, haven't eaten all day today. It's been 24 hours since I've eaten and I'm going to be in the hospital and operating all night and all day and the next day. So, you know what? I'm just going to drink 14 eggs and, uh, and call it a day. You know, and so, and that's, and that's what I've done and I've been fine, but yeah, you do run the risk, you know, do check it out. You know, if you're, if you're going from a, you know, a trusted source and you're washing the eggs and things like that as well as you can, 
you know, you're going to reduce that risk. If you have low stomach pH, you know, that's going to, that's going to help you out too, but uh, it is a risk. If you just want to cook them, cooking, cooking works. And, um, but, um, a lot of people do raw eggs. If you want to put on muscle, you just eat meat, you just work out, and you eat meat and you have to eat enough. So you just have to keep eating until fatty meat stops tasting good. And you have to do that at least twice a day. And uh, eggs are, are great. You know, like Vince Garanda used to say that if you, if you, I think it was over 30 eggs a day uh, for, you know, who knows how big of a person, you know, probably, you know, bodybuilder sized people. That was like the equivalent of, had the anabolic effect of, of uh, low dose steroids. So, you know, there, there may be something to that and eggs are, eggs are a great addition and, and quite affordable. So, um, you know, just do be careful with the raw part of it because, you know, that that's a real risk, even though, uh, I don't think it's as, as great as people think it is, but it is real. And if people do get sick from salmonella, they can die, you know, so you need to just, you need to be smart about that sort of thing. You know, like raw meat from from most countries, that's not going to be contaminated. You know, um, and if it is, you just sear the outside. It's generally food handling. Like if someone had dirty hands and it moved that, then you're getting the bacteria, E. coli, whatever from your hands onto the meat. But the meat generally doesn't have that on it because they're very careful, especially in in Western countries. They're very careful about uh, meat that goes out and they check it uh, very rigorously. And if there's any sort of problem, they just do a whole recall. They pull it all back. So um, that I think is is more safe in those situations. But um, I think eggs are pretty safe too. But you do run that risk, so just be careful. Jesse Driscoll uh, says, "My wife has been dealing with seizures and is on all types of different meds." Under supervision of doctors, could carnivore help bring her off those meds? Three different meds. How uh, would she start? Well, you, you you start by just starting. You know, if you if you're really serious about it and you want to just get going with it, then you just just throw out all the crap in your house. You just you just get rid of all the different foods and ingredients uh, in your house. You give them away to someone that you presumably don't like because you aren't don't mind that they get poisoned, and you uh, you just stock up meat and you just eat high fat meat. And water and that's what you do and you eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good um i have a number of videos on how to get started so like um you know carnivore uh for beginners carnivore diet for beginners and fiber constipation and diet those sorts of things i have a, a playlist called uh getting started on a carnivore diet and that has a lot of things on how to do it but also why to do it why it matters why it makes a difference and why it's a good idea to keep keep doing this and uh, especially with things like seizures, I mean, that, that there's a hundred years of clinical data showing that ketogenic diets in general, like a carnivore diet, which should be ketogenic, in my opinion, um, that they, they have significant benefits to people with epilepsy and suffering from seizures, certainly many forms of seizures in any case. So that's, um, that's something that you should uh, that I would absolutely encourage anyone to try. And I, I really get pissed off when doctors put people on um, seizure medications outside of an acute setting um, before discussing and counseling diet. You know, we have, we have patients and we do brain surgery on, we're cutting out tumors. Like that's just, that's a heightened risk for getting seizures. You start having seizures, you're more likely to have more seizures. And so you don't want them to, to develop an epileptic, uh, epileptic, disorder. And so you, you put them on anti-seizure medications for a short period of time after surgery. That's standard practice. I totally agree with that. Outside of that, you know, when you have someone coming in, they start having new seizures. Okay, fine. You put them on medication to, to sort of uh, prevent further seizures. You have that conversation about diet next. I think it's completely unethical to just ignore that side of things and just prescribe medications. Um, you know, if it's on like a short term sort of thing, like, you know, you have surgery, they're going to be on for seven days. Fine. You don't have time to talk about diet after that. Fine. But, um, you have someone with, with seizure disorder. I think, I think it's, it behooves us to discuss this because that's, that's a very, very strong adjunct to these other treatments. In fact, it was the treatment for seizures for a very long time before pharmaceuticals came out. So that's how you start. Um, ketogenic is the main thing there. 
Uh, it just changes your brain energy, how your brain runs and functions. And uh, but the carnivore ketogenic carnivore diet, I think, is even better because you're removing a lot of different potential triggers for seizures that have nothing to do with carbohydrates, insulin, and ketones. So I think that I think they're all all important. So what you do is you definitely work with her doctors. You do not come off medications without help of her doctors, and you go on a carnivore diet, strict ketogenic carnivore diet, keep those ketone levels high. So very high fat and, um, and, and higher, higher ketone seems to be, uh, beneficial for suppressing seizures or really probably, you know, the other way around is maybe precipitating the seizures again, cause and effect. You remove something, the effect goes away. Is that Part of the cause of this something, something you have to think about. So, uh, and then you, you you work with her doctors. If she's seizure free for six months to a year and she's feeling great, you know, that's uh, that's potentially a time that her doctors may feel comfortable weaning her off one medication partially and seeing how she does. She needs someone on board though. She needs one of her doctors on board to to be able to um, do this safely. These things aren't safe to come off uh, very quickly. You have to do it in a very slow uh, slow, and um, progressive manner. But the main thing is, is doing the diet and making sure that she's seizure free. The longer she's seizure free, the less likely is she ha to have another seizure. And so that's good. So unless she actually stops her seizures, obviously you can't consider coming off medications if she's still having seizures every now and then. So she has to be very, you know, very healthy and seizure free for a very long period of time before you start considering at least six months to a year. And then, you know, talk to her doctor about, Hey, what do we think about this? And, um, and then, you know, but the thing is, though, is that, you know, you know, ketogenic carnivore diet is going to help anyway. She's going to be a lot health, healthier in a lot of other ways. So even if she can't come off those medications, you know, she's still going to be better off for it. So I would definitely highly encourage that. But don't try to come off these meds on your own. It's 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 really unsafe. Uh, so you need help. And if her, you know, current doctor isn't isn't really willing to come off on that, you can always get a second opinion from from another neurologist to to try to help her wean off. You know, there should be someone out there that can help. Jason Anthony Wilper says, also, always a pleasure to listen to these. Really enjoy them. I like the uh, the depth. It's a bit like a university lecture in the best possible way. Thank you so much for uploading. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I sometimes wonder if I go into too much depth and <laughs> don't get to enough questions. But I think that a lot of these questions, they need depth. You know, you, you can't just sort of just say, oh, yeah, just, you know, like the last question, you know, it's like, oh, how do we start that? Yeah, just, just start. Just start. Stop eating plants. Just only eat meat, and uh, yeah, and then talk to your doctor. I mean, you, I, that's essentially what I said, but obviously, there's much more context to that, and I think that's important to go through. So, at least someone appreciates it. Thanks for that, Rochelle uh, Alves says, "New here, um, doing keto and considering carnivore." Uh, thanks to you. Good. Can you get enough omega three, DHA, EPA? for good brain health from meat and eggs alone. I was hoping not to eat salmon or fish oil fear of oxidation. Yeah, you know, the fish oil supplements aren't a great, great idea. Um, well, I don't know when it was, but it was a few years ago. And I think it's probably done more than once because I've heard this a few times that you know, independent testing labs that you know tested uh, fish oil supplements and they just found like 70% of them were oxidized by the time you got they got on the shelf. They're monounsaturated fatty acids, so they have that double bond, and that, that's a point of, of attack. They, they can just pop that double bond. These other molecules can, can break that, take that energy, and uh, they, they can oxidize and just change, change the dynamics of that uh, molecule. It's not the same molecule anymore. And so it's, um, it's important to sort of get this in 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 the fish, in the meat, in, in the animal itself. Because once you take that out, just like with seed oils, plant oils, they oxidize and they, they break down into pretty nasty, nasty chemicals. Um, they are more stable in the plant. They are more stable in the meat. So, you know, yes, you're going to get omega-6s and other sorts of nasty things from eating plants that have, you know, fats and oils, but they're, they're way worse when you have 
that liquid extract oil that's sitting there oxidizing and breaking down and getting all nasty, especially if you cook with them that rapidly uh, increases the degradation and oxidation of these things. Uh, same with fish oil, you know, it's not, you're not cooking with it, but it is degrading. And, you know, 70% are, are oxidized by the time they hit the shelf and those, and you have three month supply in a bottle. What are the odds that they're not going to be completely oxidized, uh, you know, shortly after buying them or, or halfway through using them? Even if you put them in the fridge, you know, you don't even know if that, that they were unoxidized in the first place. So um, I, I think it's best to get it from the meat. You'll get plenty of DHA and EPA from, uh, you know, terrestrial animals um, like cows and, and uh deer and sheep and things like that and eggs but you'll get a lot more depending on what that animal ate so a beef that's been in a feedlot for over three months some studies have shown that they actually don't have much uh omega-3s at all so definitely grass-fed and, and finished is going to have a better omega-3 profile and same with pasteurized eggs Pasteurized eggs, <laughs> pasteurized, pasteurized eggs. If you just cook them, they pasteurize. Um, pasteurized eggs. Uh, we'll, we'll just, you know, it, it, it does matter what the animal is eating. Will most people do brilliantly on grain finished beef? Absolutely. You'll do better on that than basically anything else you're going to eat. But there is an objective difference between these nutrients uh, and the omega 3 profiles. So if that's something that you, you know, do want to, take advantage of, then, you know, grass fed and finished is the way to go. The way to figure that out is the fat yellow. If the fat's white, probably not grass finished. Even if it says grass fed, it may not be grass finished. Any cow can be called grass fed because they live on a pasture. They eat grass. And it's only for the last few months they go into a feedlot. So they all get to say grass fed, but it's grass fed and finished. So if the fat's yellow, you that that's actually a good sign that that's been eating grass up and you know up until the end right mm -hmm. so uh that's a good way of telling and then you know pasteurized eggs things like that are a good good plan as well uh grass-fed butter you know excellent source of of these uh fat soluble nutrients also and healthy fats uh and be a lucky i think that's how they say it um and says at a comfortable weight do not want to reduce any more. How do I know that my body knows this? Uh, sure, others have been in a similar boat. Yeah, it, it's a bit scary, isn't it? But you know, if if you can under eat on a carnivore diet, it's very easy to do that, and you can just because you're just not hungry. You don't feel hungry in the same way that you used to before. So you're just you know you're just like oh I don't need to eat. Well, I ate some and hmm, I feel that that's enough. And that's normally what we we would do in order to say slim and trim. And, uh, and not get out of shape uh, or put on weight. You don't do that anymore. You eat until fatty meat stops tasting good and you may have to do that twice a day. You know, I see see people do this all the time. I have to, I have to you know, really encourage my dad every time I go back to see him to, to eat more because he is in this camp. I did that for years in my early 20s because no one told me any of this stuff. And I just didn't eat for four days in a row because I'm, I'm just not hungry. I'm just not hungry. But it was it was seriously affecting my uh, ability to perform athletically after. I mean, it took like two years, but it happened. And eventually I just said, OK, look, I, I may not feel hungry, but I have to eat. I'm clearly not getting enough. Um, and that's what you do. So, you know, like I, I, I told my dad this last time I was there is like every day you just need to eat like it's your job. Your job is to eat food. That's what you do now. And so, you know, that's your job. You have to eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. You do that at least twice a day. And, uh, and you know, obviously don't eat anything else. Um, but that's what you have to do too. So if, if, you're, if you're eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good and you're not eating anything else, you can listen to your body signals. There may be outliers out there. Uh, people on medications, different medications can alter your, your hunger, either for or against eating more. Uh, caffeine, caffeine is going to, going to suppress your hunger and maybe you do eat less than you, than you should. I'm talking about just eating meat, just eating water, nothing else to complicate the issue. Then yes, you, you should be able to do that. 
Uh, how do we know this? Well, we don't necessarily know it for sure. This is just this has just come from observing the known world. Animals in the wild eat until they decide to stop. It's not oh they just they're just eating and then they've run out of food. No, that's not that's not the case. You know, pack, uh, herd, uh, pride of lions. You know, it takes down an elephant, and there are elephant hunting lions. You know, they have they have food for days. You know, they're they're not sitting there just gorging themselves. And like, oh my god, they choose to stop. You know, king lion gets to eat as much as he wants before any other lion gets to touch it. It's called the lion's share. He eats as much as he wants of what he wants. And he doesn't just gorge himself. He's just puking and fat and all these sorts of things. He's not under eating as well. He's just eating until something in his body tells him that's enough. And he stops. And that works. And that works for us too. And that goes by taste. You have to relearn your hunger signals. They'll, they are there. They're just much more subtle. They're very different. So just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. And you'll be, you'll, you'll be where your body wants you to be. That's what happens for animals in the wild. And that's what we've been uh, observing in humans that start to eat their natural diet as well. If you're losing a lot more weight than you, than you think you want, you might be under eating. So get rid of things that might curb your appetite like caffeine and then and then eat until fatty meat stops tasting good twice a day just to make sure that you're getting enough hey everyone if you need a little extra help getting started on a carnivore diet and my online resources that i have for free aren't enough for you you can go to www.howtocarnivore.com and sign up for a 30-day carnivore challenge where you'll have online resources group support weekly Zoom meetings, as well as the ability to chat live with myself, Simon Lewis, and the others in the challenge who can help you and support you and give you extra advice and help you along the way. So if that sounds like something that would be beneficial to you, then please go to howtocarnivore.com and sign up. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you there. Eat fat. Thanks for this good good add-on, good um, uh, segue into that. Eat fat. Thank you for the super chat. Female friend, 34 years old, with autoimmune hepatitis, takes nine milligrams of uh, budesonide. I hmm, haven't come across that one before. Uh, have you seen improvements on carnivore or any recommendations? Thank you. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't treat autoimmune hepatitis or or hepatitis in general, but you know, any autoimmune issue, I I think will be very much affected and benefited by a carnivore diet, at least from all of the, the autoimmune issues that I've seen so far, I have yet to see an autoimmune condition that doesn't respond extremely well to a pure red meat and water diet. And it really does do best on red meat and water only grass fed and finished as the ultimate expression of, of, um, of, uh, the ideal simply because what I think seems to be the case and what the, what the evidence shows to me is that the things that we're eating, basically the plants and the garbage that are not designed for our bodies, our bodies are re reacting to and responding to. And these things can glom on to different parts of our body, like our you know thyroid and our liver and pancreas and all these other sorts of things and intestines, joints all these sorts of things, they can glom onto these things and start attacking them and the body starts attacking that. And you make these specific antibodies towards that plant toxin, usually lectins and organ complex. And so you get specific antibodies towards, towards, um, towards your organs. Um, but when you stop eating these things, we measure these antibodies, they go down, they go down, they go away because the assault is not happening on your body anymore. That complex is not there, those lectins aren't there, and you don't have any problems. So I, I, I can tell you with certainty that that would be the case with things like Crohn's disease, because we actually have you know, uh, experimental data in humans showing that uh, with elimination diets and removing carbs and fiber and all these sorts of things, um, that those, those improve. Uh, with, uh, Autoimmune hepatitis, I, I haven't come across that enough, but um, I would bet that it would because I've just never seen an autoimmune issue that didn't respond like that. And if that's the underlying disease process and and pathology, then that's going to apply to any autoimmune disease. And I and I'm that's what I 
feel that is um, is the case with with autoimmune diseases in general. So it's definitely well worth the well worth the shot. Uh, red meat and water only is going to be her best bet. Improve sleep, reduce stress. These things all matter as well. But uh, definitely the food is, I think, most important. TKM seven two one one. Thank you very much for the very generous super chat. I appreciate it. Hi, Dr. Chafee, been carnivore about five years. My teeth are quite stained from years of smoking. Do you have a view on coconut oil pulling? Thanks for all you do. Um, I don't. I don't really know what that is. Um, I, I, in for the context, I would imagine that's something to do with using coconut oil to destain your teeth. Um, if that's just something you're applying topically and it's and it's helping pulling out the the stain and you're not swallowing it or drinking it or eating it in any large form, I don't I don't see the problem in that. Um, if you have you know you know your dentist has other sorts of treatments that can help with the whitening of your teeth. You know, I mean, it's, it's I'm sure there are reasons not to do this for optimal health, but you know, if it's just a just a one off sort of thing and it and it helps the staining. You know, it's probably not that big of a deal. I, if that's what you're talking about with coconut oil, probably not too much of a problem as long as you're not ingesting any of these things. Um, and it's just going onto the enamel and not soaking into your mucosa. And even if it were, it'd be very minimal. So uh, if that's what you're talking about, then I, I'd say go for it. You know, if it's something that can reduce the staining on your teeth, I, I certainly don't know of any reason why it would be detrimental to your health anyway. Not that I know of. But um, like I said, I don't I don't actually know what that is, so I can't <laughs> I can't speak too knowledgeably about that. But if it's just for staining of the teeth, it's probably fine. Uh, there's a comment from Darvit. Um, Anthony Chafee, thank you so much for helping me with the weird symptoms. I'm in my 40s. Um, also oh, in my 40s, also, and finally got a diagnosis of hypermobile EDS, thanks to the information you gave me. I'm grateful. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm glad that you got that, uh, at least know what's going on. And also, you know, EDS, uh, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, is, uh, is something that I've seen people improve remarkably on even by just eating a lot more meat and, and getting off the carbs. For some reason, the carbs seem to screw everything up. But um, I need a lot more meat. People have, have found that um, it's, well, at least my patients have found, and I, you know, I have a limited number of them with Ehlers-Danlos, but I do have them. And, um, and other people that I've spoken to online that have improved as well, that their pain has has largely gone um, and their dislocations have have gone when they're eating mostly meat and when they're not you know then it comes back so again there's that cause and effect relationship you remove the cause the effect should go away unlike cholesterol when you remove cholesterol heart disease and cardiovascular disease mortality goes up so you know that's not that's not what you want um, not a good cause and effect relationship there, but with Ehlers Danlos, there seems to be. And so, when you remove these things and you start eating more meat, people's Ehlers Danlos get better. I would imagine that this is because you're getting in all the substrates necessary to form proper collagen as opposed to allowing you know, letting your body uh, just make de novo collagen, uh, which is, you know, if you have genetic reason why you're not making collagen properly and you have to make this from scratch every time yeah you're going to have you know you're going to have poor quality uh collagen and if you're eating collagen and you're eating meat that has collagen has these amino acids that we can use as building blocks for that you don't need to do it de novo you have all the building blocks there you just put them together like a lego set and uh, i would imagine that that's what's going on that's at least an explanation that that explains the the observed phenomena in any case. Henny Small, thank you for the super chat. When fasting and aiming for 72 hours to get the peak autophagy benefits, do the benefits stop if you break your fast or does it continue for a while even though you have broken the fast? Well, it just it really just depends um, on, on what you're fasting from. Um, I've never seen evidence that shows that it's the lack of food 
that call, that that stimulates autophagy and stem cell um, stem cell production and mitophagy and all these other sorts of beneficial uh, phenomena. Maybe there is, but I just haven't seen it. And I've asked a lot of people who are you know quite expert in fasting and um, you know is there is there a benefit to just not eating or you know on top of being in ketosis already on a ketogenic diet like a carnivore diet is there a benefit on top of that because there are quite a lot of studies looking at fasting mimicking diets they say well fasting has all these benefits and here are these studies that show these benefit x and then they say okay fasting's hard and not everybody can do this for long periods of time so what about a diet that mimics the metabolic state of being fasted right so the so-called ketogenic diet right um does that have the same benefit? You know, does that get you benefit X? And the ones I've seen all get benefit X, sometimes even get better benefits than, than the fasting groups did with less side effects, such as hair loss. Um, and so, you know, a minimum of 100 grams of uh, protein a day seems to uh, do away with the side of some of the side effects you see from long term fasting of just not eating anything, uh, such as hair loss. So if you're just eating a carnivore diet, you're always going to be going through autophagy. You're always going to be going through mitophagy. You're always going to be turning these cells over. You're always going to be in that state because you're always going to be in a fasted state. And so if you are fasting from a carnivore diet and you start eating meat after that, yeah, that's going to continue because it never stopped in the first place. And it didn't start because you stopped eating meat. It stopped when you stopped eating carbs because your insulin went down and insulin disrupts over a hundred different um, metabolic processes in your body shuts down what changes and, and, and disrupts uh, a lot of processes when insulin gets out of balance. Insulin lowers blood sugar. Sure. That's one of its many effects. It has over a hundred different effects in your body. And so when you raise it artificially for blood sugar reasons, now it's out of balance for every other other reason. It doesn't just go, oh, no, well, this is going to be just for, you know, just for uh, the, the blood sugar part of it. Every, everyone else just be chill. We're doing everything normal. No, it, it goes up. It affects everything up at that level. If your insulin is at three normally and then you eat carbohydrates and goes up to 16, it's, it, you know, it was affecting things at a three. All the hundred plus different things it's affecting at a three. Now it's affecting it at a 16. Well, what the hell is that doing? Well, it's, it's getting everything out of balance. And there's a lot of people that have much higher insulin levels than that. I mean, there's, there's people that just have fasting insulin of 16. So it never goes below 16. And then when they eat, it jumps up to 30, 40, 50. I had a gentleman that came in a couple of weeks ago. His fasting insulin was 72 fasting. So he had fasted uh, and his insulin didn't come down below 72. I mean, that's, that's serious metabolic distress and harm. And, um, you know, so that's, you know, that's, that's a problem that we're working on, but guess what? Carnivore diet just lowers that right down to normal very quickly. Uh, for him, it's going to be longer than, than other people, but, uh, it'll still happen. It'll still happen relatively quickly. It took decades for him to get there. It's, it's going to take weeks for him to get out you know, which is a pretty damn good deal. Uh, I'd say, well, not all the way out. It won't be weeks for all the way out. It can be months and years to get all the way out, but that insulin will start coming down straight away. Um, and it affects things. It affects all these sorts of things. So that's what shuts down your stem cells. That's what shuts down autophagy. That's what shuts down mitophagy. So your mitochondria aren't as plentiful and they're not as as effective, efficient, and and um, they they can beget diseases because your mitochondria really run the show. They really run and organize your your cells from the inside out. And when they don't work right, you don't work right. And so, um, just studies on ketogenic diets, just being on a ketogenic diet for three four months, you have four times the number of mitochondria, and they're four times as effective. So obviously, this is going on without fasting. It's the metabolic state you want to be in, not you just don't, not a lack of food altogether. If there are benefits of just not eating, you know, that's possible, but I I I I haven't seen any studies that that display that. I'm sure people like 
you know, uh, Jason Fung, you know, who's way more uh, knowledgeable than I am on fasting. He, he may know of data on that. And I'd be very interested in that. I and mean, if it's something that benefits on top of just eating a carnivore diet, then, you know, I'd be interested in knowing that. I mean, it's certainly something we're capable of, you know, Mongol, Mongol horde, Genghis Khan, they, they would go five days ravaging the countryside and they, without eating. And then they, they'd eat 10 pounds of horse meat and do it again, you know? And so, you know, all predators, they have to be able to subsist on their own body fat and nutrients for long periods of time between kills. So that's normal. So we're definitely set up for that. But is that an advantage? Is it an advantage to not eat, to have less access to resources? I don't see how that would make too much sense biologically. Um, you know, and when, when humans were hunting mammoths, like you didn't, you didn't need to get a mammoth every day, you know, maybe you got a mammoth or two for the year and your, your tribe was eating well every day for the year, you know, and, uh, Plains Indians in, in North America up to the 1800s when they're just doing Buffalo and they're doing Buffalo drops, they ate every day all year. If they wanted to, they had access to pemmican all year round. So, I don't know that there's an advantage. I don't know why there would be biologically uh, to just not eating as opposed to eating our our requisite diet. Um, but if people know about studies that that suggest that compare ketogenic diets to fasting and have different outcomes, please pop it in the chats. Tag me in it. I'm I'm always interested in these sorts of things. The one ones that I've seen have you know, the same or even better benefits when doing a ketogenic diet. We haven't even done it with carnivore yet, you know? So, um, that's, that's what we want to do is, uh, is, is know if there's an actual difference between eating properly and not eating at all. I would bet that, um, the benefit comes from just eating properly and just not eating the improper things. Stags, thank you very much for the super chat being carnivore. Uh, for three months, the doctor's concerned. Yeah, some do do get that way. Total cholesterol is 10.8. Triglycerides are 0 0.5. Fantastic. HDL 1.92, even better. LDL is immaterial. Um, and then all the rest of it. So, you know, again, cholesterol was never the problem. It was a scapegoat by the sugar companies. You know, that's, that's their words, not mine. And so this was never the problem. We look at total cholesterol, then we're looking at LDL, then we're looking at ratios, and we're looking at FOB. It's just shifting the goalposts. It was never the damn problem in the first place. You go back and you look at the, the, the data that was available at the time. There was no association whatsoever between cholesterol or LDL and heart disease at all. None. And in fact, things like the Framingham study showed an inverse association between total cholesterol and cardiovascular death and mortality, right? So the lower your total cholesterol, the more people died of heart attacks and strokes. So this was just misrepresented. This was the, the AHA, the American Heart Association is a pack of lying somethings. And they have multiple times throughout the last century in, in well-documented instances, been bought and paid for by the food industries, um, such as the sugar companies or people on their boards or in charge of it being on the payroll of the sugar companies, the big food companies. Procter & Gamble bought Crisco from the Germans who, who invented it as, as machine lubricant for tank gears, I believe. And Procter & Gamble bought it and said, yeah, let's just feed it to these idiots. And and they paid the American Heart Association $20 million to lie and say that it was better for your heart than animal fats like lard and butter and say it was really good for your heart. It's much better than ugh, this. I don't want that. You want Crisco. It's clean, wonderful Crisco. This clean, beautiful machine oil lubricant. Um, it's disgusting. You know, and this isn't this isn't conjecture. This isn't a conspiracy theory. It's a it's an historical fact. It's on the record. It's a matter of record. So again, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I appreciate your doctor's concern, but 
you know, that is just not what the evidence shows us. What the evidence shows us is that high LDL, low triglycerides means you're very metabolically healthy. You likely don't have metabolic syndrome. You're unlikely to have diabetes. And those are the major risk factors uh, besides smoking and drinking um, for um, cardiovascular disease. And higher LDL is associated with longevity. Higher total cholesterol is associated with longevity. In studies with, sorry, 12 million people for LDL. And um, we just see more and more and more data showing that LDL and total cholesterol have absolutely nothing to do with development of heart disease. Um, there have been three studies that I've found that show these results, but um, you know, one that I'll mention is the 2009 study out of UCLA where they looked at a something like 134,000 people who've had a heart attack in, uh, I believe it was just in America, and 73% had low or ideal LDL cholesterol. And about that many had um, low HDL as well. So HDL is much more predictive of getting a heart attack than LDL was. And of course, the conclusion of, that, of these authors were, oh, apparently our, our threshold for for LDL is, uh, isn't low enough. We need to lower it even more, you know? Um, and it's either, well, if you keep lowering, and this is, this is actual, uh, guideline recommendations. If you keep lowering your LDL, but your patient keeps having heart attacks, you just keep lowering that LDL. You know, there's no, there's no lower threat. You can just get rid of LDL. Just have zero of it. It's only poisonous. I mean, that's why, that's why, you know, our bodies make it, um, is because it's poison. It wants to kill us and we just have to fight nature in order to not die. I mean, how stupid you have to be to believe that, that we have an internal kill switch that, that, uh, you know, is just, is just killing us from the inside. Um, that's, that's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous statement for any doctor or biologist, serious biologist to, to, to make. Um, and, uh, and, but that's the recommendations, just lower it, lower it, lower it, lower. Well, when are you going to figure out that if you keep lowering LDL and they keep having heart attacks, when are you going to figure out the LDL isn't the bloody problem there? You know, use your damn head, you know? And, uh, but the problem is that people don't, you know, because they're brainwashed. We've been, we've been absolutely indoctrinated for a long time. And that, and that includes, and I'm talking about doctors have been do indoctrinated by the drug companies for a long time and, and everyone else as a consequence of that indoctrination. So, you know, think about it this way. We've had genetically, genetically the same. So population genetics, if people, if people study population genetics, you'll understand that if you have a percentage of alleles genes in a, in a population, regardless of how that population grows or, or, or shrinks, expands or shrinks, that you will have that same percentage of alleles in the population, unless there's some mass, you know, genocide and die off and extinction event or a mass migration of people coming in, you'll, you'll keep that percentage. So right now we have had, we have the same percentage of, of people that have familial hypercholesterolemia worldwide that we did in the 1800s. The first death from heart attack uh, confirmed on autopsy in America it was in 1912. There wasn't a single case throughout American history or the colonies before that. 1912 was the first one. I've been able to find exactly eight case reports of uh, people dying from a heart attack in all of Europe throughout the entire 18th century. I'm sure there are more, but if that were the most popular killer. We were eating more meat in the 1800s than we were in the early 1900s because vegetarianism started getting pushed really hard in the 1800s because of the puritanical movement and the temperance movements because they thought that the women especially shouldn't eat meat because it gave them carnal desires. You eat of the flesh, you'll think of the flesh and and they can't have that. You know, can't have people reproducing and being healthy and fertile. Nope, nope, nope. We need to suppress that. And so the idea was if you were a virtuous person, you would go vegetarian to suppress your sexual urges in any experiment, any model and any observation in nature. When animals stop being interested in mating and reproduction, they are sick. There is something wrong. And that's what we're reproducing. That's where they were intentionally reproducing. And you see the meat consumption sort of going down throughout the 1800s, probably as a consequence of this, of this sentiment that you need to eat a vegetarian diet in order to suppress your sexual urges. That's certainly what the Seventh-day Adventists believe. And then they codified that in religious doctrine by saying God said it. And then 
that spread out from there. And now you have, you know, the consequences of that with, you know, Dr. Kellogg's and all the cereal companies that, that came up as a consequence of Dr. Kellogg's and sanitarium foods, uh, you know, um, um, the Seventh-day Adventists like sanitarium foods who are the major influencers of nutritional studies, dietetics, the curriculums, and um, and the studies that are being put out. So, I mean, this is all, this just goes crazy. But again, reading more meat in the 1800s, there's exactly eight deaths from heart attacks in the, in the literature. There's exactly one that I can find in the 1700s. With the same exact percentage of people have familial hypercholesterolemia in the 1800s and 1700s and before, as we do right now, when this is the number one killer in the world. So that, that's a, that there's just LDL equals death. Why weren't anyone, why wasn't anyone dying then? And if you say, oh, well, we just didn't notice it, you're retarded, right? We saw eight of them. So people didn't know what to look for. Read a textbook from the uh, medical textbook from the 1800s. They are insanely detailed. William Osler's textbook, my great grandfather was a doctor, who graduated uh, from Columbia, the youngest ever graduate from Columbia Medical School to date. He was 20 years old when he graduated Columbia Medical School, top of his class. He has William Osler's textbook. And it's that big. I have it at, um, at, at you know, my, my family's home in uh, America. It is so detailed. There are so many maladies and pathologies of the heart, all these different ways that people can die and then, then look and what happened. Oh, and this is what happened. This is not a single damn mention of any, you know, uh, coronary thrombi in, in the coronary vessels. Um, why is that? It's just too stupid to figure it out. I mean, these guys dissecting everything else about the heart, looking at all these different sorts of things, and they just, they just totally miss that. They just totally miss this big blockage that killed off half the heart and it scarred over. Really? You know, I mean, you, you have to be a special kind of stupid or ignorant to uh, to believe that. Um, it's wrong. It's dead wrong. So why is it? Why is it that the first heart attack you know, proven on autopsy was in 1912 in America. 10 years later, there were many more. 10 years after that, number one killer in America. Now it's the number one killer worldwide. And there were eight in all of Europe throughout the entire century of the 1800s. Why is that? Is it really because of cholesterol? Is it really because of meat? We're eating more meat in the 1800s than we were in the 1930s when this was the number one killer in America or became the number one killer in America. We're eating more meat in 1912 than we were in 1930 when this became the number one killer in America. It was a U-shaped curve. So we're eating less and less and less throughout the 1800s. It dips, it's at its trough in the 1920s and 30s when this becomes the number one killer. And then it starts slowly coming back up. So there isn't even a correlation. So sorry, I belabored, belabored that point, but it, it still really riles me up, obviously. But watch my video, The Truth About Cholesterol and Heart Disease. This has just killed billions of people. I mean, do we get that? Do people understand that? Like this, is, this has been responsible for the death and disease of billions of people around the world over the past century. Billions, right? So everyone, almost everyone on earth is affected by this, by these terrible recommendations, these outright frauds and lies from these drug pushing assholes. And people have gotten sick. They've gotten overweight. They've died early. They've died in disease and suffering and in, in, you know, having, having dementia and Alzheimer's and being enfeebled both mentally and physically by the billions. You have 35 year old uh, men and women having heart attacks and dropping dead in front of their children. You know, they're robbed of their entire life with their kids. Those kids are robbed from their of their parents for the rest of their life because these assholes, you know, just wanted to make a, a buck. You know, that pisses me off. And everyone should be pissed off by this. And we should, oh, well, you know, it doesn't, no bullshit. F you for ever putting this up. F you for, for trying to push this nonsense on people. F you for trying to keep propagating this bullshit when we have hard 
evidence it was a con in the first place. So people like Dr. Allo and these other assholes who who just push this sort of shit, probably because they're getting paid off. They just want to try to make a name for themselves because they're just they're just desperate to try to be popular. Like, I'm sorry you didn't have friends in school, but Jesus Christ, don't take it out on the rest of us. Like, no one is benefiting by the nonsense that these people say. People are getting hurt and they are suffering and they are dying by the billions because of this garbage that people have been spewing out there. And it is just time that this just dies and we just stop doing that and just be like, oh, but cholesterol is like, F off. That was a scam. Not talking about it. And I think that's what I'm going to start, start doing is just be like, look, watch my video on it. It's a scam. Don't worry about it because it's a scam. It is a scam. And uh, and we just, you know, the only reason that this is still alive is because we are keeping it alive by even entertaining the discussion. You know, so, oh, but you have to do this. That's bullshit. You're wrong. We're not talking about that. Read a goddamn book. You know, this was just, you know, this was, they made it up. They made it up to push their product and to protect their product. It's crap. Moving on with our lives. And that's what we should do. Uh, a bony 814. Thank you very much for the super chat. It's very kind of you. Very generous. Uh, wife and I started carnivore January 1st and together lost nearly 50 pounds. That's amazing. Great job. Any advice on how to maximize weight loss? We are eating mostly fatty meat and the occasional seafood and chicken. Thank you for all you do. Well, look, you just you just do what you're doing, man. I mean, the, <laughs> you, know, you don't have to, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? You've already lost 50 pounds together. Um, amazing. Just keep going. Like, that, that's going to keep going. When was the last time you ate till you're, you were comfortably full and enjoyed what you were eating and lost 50 pounds in, in uh, three months, right? So just keep going. You know, you're already doing a great job. You know, I mean, look, you can starve yourself into a smaller pant size and dress size. You know, everyone knows that. You can go on, on the on the concentration camp diet, but you know that's not going to be healthy. The point is not weight loss as a, as a main uh, objective. The, the point is health. You know, health gain, not weight loss. You're losing weight. You're going to continue to lose weight, but you want to do it in a healthy way. You want to be as healthy as you can be. You know, if you starve yourself, yeah, sure, you'll you'll lose weight for a time, and then it'll plateau because you're you're going to suppress your metabolism, and so it, it's counterintuitive. But you eat less, you'll actually lose less, and your body will actually stall. And you know, if you start eating more, you're, whoop, you're going to put that put that back up again because you're in because your metabolism is still down. We want to support your metabolism. We want to encourage your metabolism. We want to tell your metabolism, hey, we're not in a famine. You don't need to preserve all this energy. We we can use it. It's fine. And you do that, you're going to be very healthy. And you're going to be as healthy as you can be. And you're going to improve not only your health, but you're going to improve uh, your weight loss long term. And it's something that can be sustainable long term because you're eating until you're satisfied every day. And then you just keep doing that for the rest of your life. So um, that's how you do that. You know, maybe it doesn't have the the big, quick, short term, re immediate results that are as big and dramatic, but the long term results are going to be far better, and you're going to be doing it in a much healthier way. And that's the most important thing. I'm not worried about weight loss in and of itself as a doctor. I'm worried about health gain. And that's the most important thing. So that's that's what you want to worry about the most. And, you know, Sloan Steady wins the race, right? Tortoise and the hare. These parables exist for a reason. Um, you keep doing this in the right way, you will get farther, faster. You know, haste makes waste. So you you starve yourself, you do all these sorts of things. Yeah, you'll you'll go faster at first, but you'll 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 bung up the whole journey and it'll end up taking you longer to get there in the end. So just keep doing what you're doing, eat until fatty meat stops tasting good, exercise, lift weights, do sprints, get good sleep, reduce stress. Those are the things you need to work on. Um, um, because you already sounds like you got the diet in check. So good job on that. Keep it going. Laura Montgomery says, can eating carnivore prevent dementia? I run the risk of doing a very long answer again, but we'll see what we can do. Um, do we have any long-term human data showing one way or the other that a carnivore diet can do that? Not that I know of. 
uh, specifically not a carnivore diet. We do have ketogenic diets, um, interventional trials with ketogenic diets, showing that a high fat meat based ketogenic diet is better treatment for people with active Alzheimer's than every medication trial. So if something can help someone who has the disease, presumably it can help prevent the disease. It's not, it's not, you're not going to be contributing towards that disease process developing in the first place. Always remember this. These are ketogenic diets. That's, that's the important takeaway that your keto, ketogenic diets. But the most important thing is what kind of ketogenic diets are they? You can do a ketogenic diet with a vegetarian diet, vegan diet, whatever. It's very difficult. You're not going to get an, a lot of energy. Um, it's going to be horribly um, difficult to get enough nutrients. You have to supplement heavily. Um, but the main thing is that's not what these studies use. They didn't use vegetarian ketogenic diets. They used animal-based diets. They use high-fat animal fat animal protein diets. They use high fat meat based diets with a bit of vegetables if you wanted to, which I don't. Right. So that's what it is. So the most rigorously studied diets for dementia, for Alzheimer's, for diabetes, for thousands of other things, there are thousands of high level studies with ketogenic diets using a high fat meat based ketogenic diet. So nearly a carnivore diet, a carnivore diet with nasty ass vegetables, right? That's what these are studying. It's not vegetarian diets. The most rigorously studied diet on earth is an animal based, a whole food animal based diet that happens to exclude carbs. That's what the most studied diet on the world is. And we need to start framing our arguments like that. So, oh, but vegetarian diets show that bullshit. Those are epidemiological nonsense data that compare apples to oranges. They compare eating a uh, processed plant food diet versus a whole food plant-based diet. Well, the best diet shown yet in experimental data to reverse medical issues is an animal-based, high-fat, animal-based diet with a bit of plants. So a carnivore diet with some plants, with some vegetables. That's what, that's what the data shows. That's what the experimental data shows. That's what the high-level data shows. Epidemiolo epidemiology is not high level data and the types of epidemiology that they do for these, these plant-based studies are, are the worst of the worst because they have, um, they have, you know, just survey their survey questionnaires. They say, what have you eaten in the last two years? How would anyone know that? You know, the nurses study, they don't say, Hey, track all the meals you have for the next year and submit that. They get an email once a year that says, Hey, what did you eat last year? How would anyone know that? They're doing this on purpose to be able to manipulate the data, right? Because they can, they know that they're going to get flawed data and they can just make it look the any way they want. It's bullshit. So experimental data, experimental data that's been done has been done on carnivore diets with a salad. That's how you should frame this in your mind. And that's how you should frame this to other people that high fat meat based diets have been shown to be the best diets and the most beneficial diets for real, real world medical outcomes like diabetes and even, even um, ketogenic metabolic therapy for cancers. This is being shown to be beneficial. Animal based, meat based for, for cancers. Ooh, but, but meat causes cancer. No, a bloody will doesn't. And um, so what's the evidence for dementia and carnivore? Well, Animals in the wild don't get dementia. Humans before 1906 didn't get dementia. That was the Alzheimer's disease was a one-off case report from Dr. Alzheimer's that he presented at a conference. Said, "Ooh, look at this. Isn't this weird? Have this lady had this neurocognitive decline? Hmm, interesting. No one paid it much mind. They were like, well, who cares? It's just a it's just a case report. Um, and uh, but one person was watching, and he was actually really really fascinated by it. And he was a very influential guy, and he wrote a textbook." He actually wrote multiple textbooks. And the next textbook that he wrote in, for neurological uh, conditions, he used that uh, as, and he called it Alzheimer's dementia. And that's what he, he called it. So there wasn't anything in the literature before 1906 describing a similar disease process that was by any other name. That was the first incidence of it, right? Which is why he has his name on it, 1906. Right. So people weren't getting Alzheimer's before that. Right. Not in any great number to the extent that they would 
you know, get it even written up as a case report, right? Um, and we are having, you know, look at my video with Hal Cranmer. You know, he has nursing homes down in Arizona and he's reversing terminal dementia in people in his nursing home and he's getting some of them home. And the ones who don't get home, they improve dramatically by going on a high fat, animal-based, meat-based, ketogenic diet or carnivore diet if they can do it. You know, not, it's not everyone's there. You know, but eating a lot more meat, eating a lot more animal fat, those are building blocks for your body and brain. Getting rid of the carbs, getting rid of the sugar, getting rid of the alcohol, which is detrimental to your brain and your body. So, oh, well, carbs are just energy. No, they're not. Sorry to break it to you, but it's much more complex than that. You have four grams of carbs going through your body, four grams of glucose going through your body at any given time that your body makes. And that's the physiological maximum load that you can handle. One, and that covers all the physiological process for your body and brain. Four grams, that's all your body needs at any one time. Obviously, it's replenished. One extra gram is a toxic dose to your body. One extra gram causes excess glycation to the point that our body can't handle it. And it builds up to the point that we die. Diabe this is what kills diabetics. That's what they're, why well, they get their toes cut off, then their feet, then above the ankles, then above the knees, then their kidneys fail, then their heart fails, and their life fails, right? It's because of that one extra gram of, of sugar in their body. You're, this is toxic to your body, and your body responds to it as a toxin by trying to detoxify it, right? This is why we know these, these plant toxins are toxins. A, they hurt you, and B, your body desperately is trying to detoxify them and clear them out of your body. If it was good and your body wanted them in your body, your body would keep it in your body. You know, I'm sorry, but like these, these idiots with the, their epidemiology, they're not smarter than your biology. They're not smarter than nature or God, whoever you, you choose to believe uh, was responsible for, you know, where we are right now. Um, so then you see things like, um, then you see things like um, there's studies showing that higher LDL cholesterol is protective against dementia, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's, and autism, right? So, you know, you see these things that, that are protective, like higher LDL, like higher cholesterol, like higher saturated fat. Um, ketogenic diets improve and can even reverse Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. Um, and that animals don't get dementia in the wild when eating their natural diet, but they will if they're eating their un, an unnatural diet. And dementia or Alzheimer's dementia at the very least didn't exist before 1906 in any real numbers that people would notice. And so let's get back to that. I mean, people weren't even full carnivore back then. You know, they're just eating less shit. They're eating more meat, more animal fat, and less garbage. Um, so that's what we need to do. And so, yeah, a carnivore diet is just the purest form of that. You're getting rid of everything that could potentially cause harm, and you're only eating things that are good for your body. Why would that not be ideal <laughs> for people? You know, it's just like, like, okay, well, you do what's ideal, and you have a drink every now and then, some cigarettes every now and then. Yeah, you could, but you'd be better if you didn't, right? And so that's that's what the carnivore diet is. You know, does everybody have to do it? No. Does everybody who wants to be optimal have to do it? Yes, absolutely. You know, like you're not going to be optimal unless you unless you eat what is optimal for your body. If you smoke sometimes, that's not optimal. Even if your body can handle it, you can deal with it, and it doesn't. You don't really notice the difference. Just like if you have, you know, fruits and vegetables and grains and carbs and sugar every now and then, is that as bad as if you did it every day? No, it's all relative. But it, it does cause harm. These are these things have objective harmful components to them. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's just about optimization. You know, I, I've seen some people say some very strange things about me that I've never said saying that, Oh, everyone has to be carnivore and this, that, and the other. Um, I've never said that. I've, ne I've never said that. Uh, I said, if you want to be optimal, you should do that. And I just say, look, this is, this is what I think is the best. And you want to do a other derivation of that? Fine. I, I really don't care. Like I, I literally couldn't care less what free individuals want to do with their own life when given the information and choices. I just don't want people to think that they should eat in a suboptimal fashion 
because it's actually optimal that eating plants and not eating meat is actually better for their health. It's not, it is absolutely not. So I just want them to have the information and then they can make their own decision. If you want to drink, I couldn't care less. You know, I go out with friends of mine, they drink and I'm not like, Oh, you shouldn't do it. Oh God. I, I don't care. I don't care. They know it's not good for them. Everyone knows it's not good for you. I don't give a shit. You know, I don't care if they want to smoke. I just don't want them to smoke around me because I don't want that crap in my lungs. Right. But I just don't care. You know, I mean, I would, I would like it if they didn't because I, I want people to be healthy, but it's their decision if they're an adult. So, you know, I have no idea where these people get this stuff from. They just, everyone just talks trash and says, I say things that I don't, but um, I just want people to know the truth that meat is not bad for you. The fat's not bad for you. The cholesterol is not bad for you. Um, this was all a scam. And, uh, and meat's good for you. It's really important to eat meat and plants do have toxins. That's a fact. That's a well-documented fact in human data lane. Um, <laughs> Jesus, um, you know, we, we see, we see negative health outcomes in the medical literature, um, all the time, all the time with people eating, you know, various plants and getting poisoned by them. Uh, and you get subclinical or sub lethal doses of these, of these toxins, you get worse and it builds up over time and you remove these things and look at that, those diseases go away, cause and effect, right? Sort of the theme of today. Um, but that's the thing. So, uh, that's what the, that's what the human data shows that people get sick when you eat more plants and you get even more sick when you eat processed plants and sugar and seed oils. Those are plants too. They're just worse than spinach and lettuce, but spinach will kill you. You know, Liam Hemsworth, you know, put himself in the hospital with uh, acute spinach, uh, acute spinach poisoning, acute oxalate poisoning from spinach, from drinking spinach smoothies for something like three weeks every morning. You know, you, you can hurt yourself legitimately. You can even kill yourself, you know, and they say, oh, well, dose makes the poison. Okay, well, well what's the dose, dickhead? Liam Hemsworth put himself in the bloody hospital with three weeks of spinach smoothies. So maybe someone should have told him what that dose was. Huh, dickhead? You know, why don't you actually be responsible? If you're giving advice to people, you need to be responsible. Say, oh, you know, whatever. It just makes what well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you eat. It damn well does. And people have put themselves in the hospital by listening to your idiot advice. You know, you should be responsible. You should take responsibility for that. Um, but they don't, of course, because they're just children. But um, yeah, I figured out that was going to take a while to answer that question. But uh, I believe that, yes, a carnivore diet will absolutely prevent most forms of dementia. Obviously, there are going to be other sorts of things that, that can play a role, but it's at least going to get rid of the, the foodborne toxin and malnutrition reasons for dementia, in my opinion. Little Ellie Mary. Hello, everyone. Hello, little Ellie Melly. Very nice to see you. I uh, hope you're doing well. Um, what do we got going here? Hold on. Let me see how many we have. Ooh. All right. Why don't we cap the super chats here, everyone? Because I think that that's, I think we've got a lot. <laughs> uh, and I, I want to make sure we get to all of them. I need to leave in about 45 minutes. So, um, Let's, uh, yeah, let's just uh, try to address the ones we have and, and, um, and hopefully we will get to everyone. I will do my very best. Okay. Where did that go? Oh, there we go. Uh, so Danica Milabulik, thank you very much for the super chat. Would you recommend eating large amounts of saturated fat for people just starting carnivore diet? If their diets prior to this were really low in fat, it seems like if we were undernourished before, and loading might help. Well, look, your, your body has a limited capacity to absorb fat based on the amount of bile that you have. So you you're just you eat as much fat as you want. Your body's only going to absorb what it can absorb and what it wants to absorb. So you really, you really don't run a risk of eating too much fat. Um, if you're not used to eating fat, you can just make yourself feel unwell. You can just have that psychosomatic sort of response where you're like, oh, this is supposed to be bad for me. And, and you get sort of like Ugh, a little queasy about it. That happened to me, even though I knew that fat was good for me. I had to retrain myself and, and recondition myself, decondition myself from thinking that that fat was bad for me. Um, and so if that's happening to you, you, you can just ease into it. 
but um, your body's going to going to absorb what it can absorb. So you just eat as much fat as your body uh, can tolerate, uh, or or just is comfortable for you, tastes good to you, um, and then you can absorb. You know, if you just want, if you're getting dry, hard, constipated stools, you're not eating enough fat by definition. That little ex that that spillover valve of fat um, is what is what keeps your stool soft. A lot more than your body can absorb. It's, it's going to go out as waste. You know, it's just going to come out and it's going to come out as uh, you're going to get diarrhea. You can get diarrhea for other reasons too, but that's one of them. And so uh, just eat, eat enough fat for your body. And it can be that over time, your body starts making more bile uh, because it says, oh, look at this. We haven't had access to fat in a while. It's an expensive resource. Bile it doesn't just make it for no reason. And so they want to, you know, it wants to get that fat for a reason uh, or, you know, it wants to get enough fat. And so if it's... Um, if you're sort of exposing yourself to more fat, it could be that your body starts making more bile in the future to get more fat. But either way, you just eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good and you eat enough fat so that you have soft stools. And if you're doing that, then that, then your, your body will, you know, uh, pick up the deficit. It will, it will ask for and absorb the amount of fat that it wants to make up that deficit. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this replay of my YouTube live. If you'd like to catch a live version and ask your own questions, please go to the next scheduled one, usually every Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. All right, see you then, and please enjoy the rest of the Q&A. Brian Jones, thank you for the super chat. Two years carnivore, depression, anxiety, gone, and lost 53 pounds. Fantastic. That's absolutely wonderful. Tried Saladino's diet for a month. Um... And anxiety with panic attacks came back. I'm back on carnivore feeling great. Thanks for all you do. Well, thank you. I'm really glad um, to hear that you're doing so well. And, and, you know, thank you for sharing that. Um, so Saladino's diet, you know, Dr. Saladino uh, was one of the early early adopters of, of a carnivore diet publicly. You know, there were people doing this uh, for a very long time on Facebook groups such as uh, Zero Carb Health and Zeroing In on Health, like Dana Schutz and... Um, uh, Charles Washington, that they, they sort of run those. Uh, they're both, you know, great. I, I need to have them both on, on my podcast. Clearly I've been actually meaning to do that for like two years now, but, um, um, uh, you know, it's just some, I just need to, I just need to, to, to get on it, but there is a wealth of information. I've been doing this for like nearly 20 years and they've been leading these Facebook groups and, and, and talking to tens of thousands of people over the years. And, um, you know, but but Saladino has been doing this for a long time, and he was one of the people that that helped you know promote and propagate this. He felt that he does does better on with fruit and and some honey. You know, fine if that's how if that's what his body is telling him to do. Um, I definitely don't feel better that way. I definitely feel better without any of that stuff. And that's what I've noticed with a lot of people as well is that when they're doing that, they they feel good. They feel a lot better. They're getting rid of all this stuff. Uh, but then when they get rid of that and they just go down to meat, they do even better, which is great, especially with things like mental health, anxiety, and and those sorts of things, uh, depression, schizophrenia, autism, all these sorts of things. Really being in ketosis on a ketogenic state is is actually really important, and uh, and getting rid of the carbs is actually quite uh, beneficial. Um, so if people suffer from that, probably a good idea to to not do that side of things. I get worried. Um, because a, like I said, you know, the carbohydrates, you know, more than four grams of glucose in your body is toxic to your body. And so we're dumping in hundreds of grams of, of glucose into our body a day. You know, that's hard for your body to deal with. And you, and you are getting some, some residual, uh, damage from that. Even if your, your insulin is able to get that down, it's up for a while and it's causing more glycation until your body can bring that down. And so I think that that's not, not ideal. And, uh, I do see a lot of people that do try that and they get carb addicted again, they're, they're sugar addicts and they get, you know, and they start eating a bit of fruit and a bit of honey. And then it's a bit more fruit and a bit more honey. Then it's a lot more fruit and a lot more honey. And then it's pizza and soda and other sorts of crap. Uh, and that happens, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of people go down that pathway. They go down this carb hole and they, and they, they don't have, uh, the ability to stop. And it's, um, it was, um, oh God, who was it? I was just, I was just watching him. He, you know, he, he's a funny guy. I actually really, uh, I really like him and I'm, I'm really annoyed that I'm uh, blanking on his name. Yeah. Kevin James, um, it's comedian, stand-up comedian. I, his, his original standup, I, I actually loved his original standup and obviously he's done a lot of movies and TV shows. 
um it was like uh, the mall cop uh movies and things like that uh but his stand-up was great i really liked him as a stand-up and um as well as as his movies and things like that um but he i just saw a clip of him on joe rogan where he was talking about how he's like a compulsive eater like if he gets on like a strict diet like he can do it like he fasted for like 41 days once and lost 60 pounds and he could just grit through it but he did a he apparently did a thing on um cheat days he wanted to do like a documentary on cheat days and he like work out all super hard and had a trainer and did all this sort of stuff and then one day a week he just had a cheat day and it just completely disrupted his whole uh it just disrupted his whole things um uh you know his gain he just completely sabotaged it and he was saying he's like i don't think people understand just how much i can eat just how much i can just fill pack he's, he's a compulsive eater he said i can't I can't stop you start eating these things they just you just keep going you just keep going like you know people have that compulsion they have these compulsive eating behaviors due to addictions with food because this food is addictive it's designed to be addictive sugar is addictive uh fructose is addictive and fructose is a large portion of the carbohydrate content in fruit and honey, you know, sweet fruits anyway. So that, that can hit people really hard. And I don't think that it's optimal certainly, but it can really be damaging to a lot of people. And, you know, Kevin James is one of these. And in fact, Joe Rogan said, Hey, if you want to really do something, you know, just do a carnivore diet, you know, like that's the best way because you're, you're, you just, it just stuffs, it stuffs down your, your compulsion and your overeating. It's just like, that's all I want. I'm done. You know, whereas if you have carbs and other things, you just keep eating. And he's right because there's, there's hormonal reasons for that. Your insulin goes up, insulin forces energy into cells. It doesn't allow it to come out of cells. And so now you've locked down all your fat cells in your body for about 24 hours or more. And then, you know, sometimes less, but sometimes more. And now you can't mobilize your fat stores to bolster up your blood sugar to bolster up your ketones you don't really have ketones to speak of anymore and now your blood sugar drops and now it drops too low and you know oh, i feel tired i don't have energy because you can't mobilize your energy from your from your gas tank your gas tank's cut off your fat cells are your gas tank and so then you start eating carbs again insulin goes up and carbs go down and you need to get it down up and down and up and down you get those swings throughout the day we've all played that that game and it does something more insidious than that, which is it blocks a hormone called leptin, which is our satiety hormone. It comes from our fat cells predominantly, also from our stretch receptors in our stomach. You eat a big meal, it stretches out, leptin gets released, which is why in the 80s they said, eat a whole bunch of fiber. They have no calories. You get no nutrition from it. Isn't that great? What's the hell to the point of eating if there's no nutrition in it? And it tricks your body into thinking you're full. It sends off this leptin. Your brain goes, great. We got plenty of food. You don't feel hungry. And you don't get anything from it. You just lose all this weight. Yeah, how'd that work out? You know, BC rates worse than ever. Um, oh, but people aren't doing it. Yes, they fucking were. You know, I <laughs> guess they, they were doing that. They were moving in that direction. And, um, you know, so that that's only such a small part. First of all, your, your stomach has receptors in it that track my, macro and micronutrients and goes directly to your brain and says, hey, this is what's in here. You eat a bunch of styrofoam if you want, you stretch out your, your stomach and leptin will get released and your body will go, nothing's in there, <laughs> all right? Um, so this blocks leptin, which is predominantly from our fat cells. It's like a running gas gauge on how much energy your body has. And so insulin blocks leptin. Fructose independently blocks leptin and raises insulin, which then blocks leptin further. Now your brain can't see its leptin. And so your brain thinks that you have zero energy reserves and your blood sugar is dropping. And it sends out a panic signal that says, if you don't eat now, you will die. And this is why people are just panicking. Oh, I have to starve. I have to eat. I have to eat. I have to eat. I have to eat. And they're compulsively eating because their body is telling them to, because their body is telling them they're going to die if they don't. Fructose also upregulates ghrelin, which is the op, there was the counterpart to leptin in your stretch receptors. So when your stomach's empty, it releases ghrelin. And depending on how much leptin you have, it counterbalances your ghrelin your body goes like oh okay stomach's empty but ah, we're fine or no leptin ghrelin super high and your body goes no we need to eat this is a problem so you overeat right and so so he was right so joe rogan was very very right correct in that um and um you know kevin james um i think he was doing 
with Dulce, you know, like a Dulce diet or something like that. And, and Dulce doesn't think that carbs are, are a worry. That's fine. Um, but you look at these things from a hormonal point of view, from a physiological point of view, you see that they actually do cause issues. First of all, insulin is the fat storage hormone, the fat storage hormone, right? So without insulin, you really can't store fat. Now there are lectins and plant toxins that, um, that can actually act on and bind to insulin receptors and to leptin as well and compound the issue and make this <laughs> you know a lot worse even without insulin but but insulin is the fat storage hormone right so people with type 1 diabetes don't make any insulin they they really can't put on fat they just waste away until they die unless they get insulin and then you have people that uh, have an insulinoma which is an insulin secreting tumor they get enormously obese very quickly. It doesn't matter what they eat. People that inject insulin long-term, they're injecting into the same sites. They they grow fat in those areas. They get these big bulbous fat lumps that they just inject in the same spot, which is why you have to vary it up where you inject. Um, these are very known, well-known and well-established consequences of insulin. And again, insulin has over 100 different mechanisms in the body. And so you raise your insulin, you eat carbs, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Insulin goes up because of the carbs, but now it's affecting over a hundred different processes in the body at an elevated rate at level, right? Blocks the conversion of testosterone and estrogen for women. You get PCOS. Blocks the action of growth hormone in both men and women. You age faster. You have lower IGF-1, right? It screws up men's testosterone. It blocks leptin. It makes you overeat. It screws up your energy dynamics. It takes you out of, uh, of a ketogenic state, which is our primary metabolic state. Now you don't have enough ketones to run your brain. It has to go to its secondary fuel source, glucose. Same with your heart. Same with your intestines. Same with your other organs. But there's huge consequences of eating carbohydrates in order to keep that blood sugar level below four grams. It's really important. It's really, it will kill you. This is what kills diabetics. High blood sugar. Chronically elevated high blood sugar causes you know, um, insurmountable burden of glycation, AGEs, advanced glycation end products, right? So it actually is a problem, you know, I mean, maybe you can, you can get fit, you know, and, and get lean and get strong and, and perform as an athlete eating carbs. I certainly did it. Most people have done it in the modern era. It's a hell of a lot easier to do it without them. And it's a hell of a lot more healthy to do it without them. You know, in, in the 80s and 90s, we had marathon runners saying, it doesn't matter what you eat, just as long as you exercise. Dropping dead of massive coronary heart attacks, um, in, you know, at 40, right? Top mar marathon runners in the world drop dead, right? It does matter. It really does matter what you eat. You can look like you're in shape, but you're not necessarily healthy. So again, this is all about health. Health is the most important thing. And... Um, you know, and, and so, you know, weight loss is, is, you know, important to people. Health is the most important thing. The weight will come. And, um, and, you know, we see here with our friend, Brian Jones, you know, he tried both ways for him, at least this, this worked better. And that's what I see for most people, certainly for myself, certainly for most of my patients and people that I've spoken to, um, you know, if you want to eat some fruit and honey and you find that it benefits you and you feel better and you're objectively improving, fine. You know, that's your business. That's your choice. Do what you want. I don't really see it that often. You know, I've seen a few people like Dr. Saladino say that they feel better, you know, but are they better over overall long term? I mean, we'll, you know, we'll see. But uh, I certainly don't see that in in most people. Um, and so, it's, you know, it's important to try these things out. It's important to try out a carnivore diet because I think everyone should try it out just to see what life could be like. Um, and if you want to add in some other stuff. And you feel that benefits you, just be careful because you're going to have more energy and feel better when you do cocaine every day too, right? That does not mean that you're you're getting benefit from it. Or just drinking coffee or taking caffeine. I go, oh, I feel better. This must be better. Well, no, not necessarily. What's better long term? What gives you better energy long term? What keeps you healthier long term? Those are different things, you know. So, uh, and that's and that's an argument people make against the carnivore diet. Yeah, you feel good now. Yeah, your diabetes is going away now. Yeah, your weight is going away now. Yeah, your autoimmunity is going away now. Yeah, you're coming out of the uh, uh, Alzheimer's uh, elderly care facility now. Yeah, you know, you don't have cancer now, but just wait. Sure. Okay, well, let's wait for that day. 
Um, but, um, you know, and that, that is true just because you're having short-term results doesn't mean that the long-term gains are going to be there. But at the same time, you know, when we're seeing every objective marker improving in people's health, they're coming off medications or reversing diseases that were, were said to be irreversible, even though they've only showed up in the last few decades in any real number. So obviously there's uh, something going on there that's increasing that you take that away, it goes away. Um, you know, even then they say, oh, well. You know, LDL goes up. Oh, not for everyone. And who cares? Because it wasn't a problem in the first place. Um, but, you know, and if every marker is going in, in the right direction, who's to say that LDL going up isn't LDL going in the right direction either? Think about that. Why would everything be improving and just this one thing going wrong? No, I think we're looking at that wrong. Again, we are. LDL was not the problem. Higher LDL is associated with better health and longer life and lower rates of cancer, and lower rates of infectious disease, and lower rates of Alzheimer's, dementia, and auto autism, and Parkinson's, right? So LDL going up is also an objective improvement in people's biomarkers as well. A lot of tangents there. Hopefully that was not, <laughs> not too boring, but thank you for your, uh, thank you for that, Brian. I appreciate that. It's important for people to see uh, people's experiences with this. I appreciate that. And thank you for the super chat, little Ellie Melly. Nice to see you. Um, El Marie says, I love how much I learned from you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. It was very kind of you. And I'm glad that it's interesting and um, informative. Brandon Winter. Um, let me see here. Brandon Winter says, oh, thank you for the super chat. First of all, I've heard carnivore can help Crohn's. But has it helped Crohn's patient with fistulas and healing fistulas? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, your body has to heal those fistulas. It depends on how um, how bad they are, what they're going into. But you know, it can it can uh, stop the disease process and lower your antibodies, so lower your body stops attacking itself, and your body has a chance to heal. Does that mean that you don't need surgery? You don't need help? Absolutely not. You need to fistulas are very, very, very uh, problematic. They can heal. But, you know, if they're going into some place that's not supposed to be there, you have a colovocycle fistula, you need to get that sorted out. I mean, you, you're going to cause infections and, and uh, horrible outcomes if that's not treated properly. So 100 percent still you know, work with your doctor, your surgeon um, for those and uh, but also do a carnivore diet and uh, really just a uh, line diet is the best thing for any autoimmune disease especially Crohn's disease, you'll see it firsthand. You have a pork chop, you're going to know about it. And um, if you just have beef, lamb, and water, you're going to you're gonna have the best results. Um, it will just shut down the disease process because it's going to remove all the things that your body's reacting to and, 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 and making antibodies towards. And then your body can have a chance to heal. Fistulas are nasty stuff. You got abscesses, you have fistulas, you have these sorts of things. Sometimes you have to have surgery, you have to have interventions. Sometimes they can heal. They, they will start to heal, but you may need help at, at the same time. So yes, they it takes away the cause, the root cause of Crohn's disease, which is your body reacting to these toxins and chemicals that aren't supposed to be in your body. And it also allows your body to heal. Can your body heal from all damage? Not every time. And so you still need help for a lot of these things too. So work with your doctor, but also do carnivore. Absolutely. Uh, Amber, thank you for the super chat. Thank you for always being generous with your time. It does not go unnoticed. Thank you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And I hope it is helpful to people and that, uh, yeah, people get, get something out of it. And um, yeah, it's not, it's not too much. Jade, thank you for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee. How can I get rid of, uh, uh, acanthosis nigrans on my neck? Thank you. Um, I actually am pretty sure that that's been shown to be directly um, related to insulin resistance. And so that's one of those things that, you know, just going on like ketogenic diets in general should help. Um, I am I am pretty sure. So, you know, going on like ketogenic, like um, going on a ketogenic diet of any form, like a carnivore diet should actually help that. Um, it can take time, but that actually should reverse that if I'm not mistaken, but I'm pretty damn sure that that is, um, that that has been shown to be a consequence of insulin resistance, just like skin tags and, um, uh, and colon, um, polyps. 
those are highly associated with, with insulin resistance and high levels of insulin and our body's just going haywire because again, you know, over a hundred different mechanisms in our body, um, has insulin. So it's, uh, that's just one of the consequences of, of very high insulin. And so you drop the carbs, your insulin will come down and those sorts of things start to reverse. And I am nearly positive that that's one of them. And, um, yeah, that's that, that, so that should sort itself out given time. It can take time. So just give it time. Um, Rob McG 95. Thank you very much for the super chat chat. I've heard that one should transition to carnivore diet slowly over a number of weeks or microbiome related problems can arise. What are your thoughts on this? And is this something you've seen? I haven't really seen it myself in many people. There are some people that get like diarrhea and a bit of, you know, upset stomach. Is this because they're having something else that could upset their stomach? Is this because they're eating a lot more fat or not enough fat? Maybe. Um, could it also be the microbiome? Maybe. Absolutely. Uh, the vast majority of people that I've seen uh, do transition very easily. And then they uh, and then they go and they check their microbiome before and then three, four months after, six months after, massive improvements in their in their gut microbiome. Your gut microbiome changes really from day to day, depending on what you eat. If you're eating a varied diet, you're going to support different bacteria based on what you eat because there's just more resources available. Remember, they have a, they have a 20 minute turnover. They, they reproduce every 20 minutes in general. You know, most bacteria do. So they're, they're generated, they, they've, you know, a uh, very, very, very fast generation rate. And so you, you can see things, populations go up and down and up and down very, very quickly. Um, I do know that Professor Bart K thinks that this is a good thing to do is, is transition slowly. And, um, you know, and I have, I have, you know, I've, you know, seen very clearly that if, if Professor K has, you know, says something, there's, there's a very good reason behind that. And so, you know, either with his personal experience or, or according to the literature, um, there is a good reason for him to say that. And so, um, you know, you could do that and be safe, but I've, you know, I transitioned right away twice. Um, and, and most of my patients, I just, you know, because it's, it's difficult to sort of drip someone into something, you know, they either do it or they don't do it. And so when you're, when you're trying to help people and just get them going, it's sometimes best to strike while the iron's hot and just throw everything out of the house and just get going that day. The vast majority of people will be fine doing this. Um, if you want, if you want to be a bit more staged about it, you can, but have a clear and distinct timeline on what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Right away, you start eating a lot more fatty meat and you drop the carbs, sugar, and alcohol and processed food. All that's gone today, right? And then one week later, you mark it on the calendar. This day, I'm dropping nightshades, potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers. Now you're already getting rid of tomatoes or potatoes because of the carbs anyway, but you get rid of all those. Then the next week, you're getting rid of all high oxalate foods. And then next week, you're getting rid of all nuts and beans and seeds and legumes and all that sort of crap. And then you're just down to like some leafy green salads and meat. And then the next week, you just drop that crap too, right? So you have a clear stepwise progression and staged process of just getting rid of this crap. Um, and if you don't do that, it's, you're not going to do it. So, uh, it's very unlikely. It's like, you know, salespeople will say, if you don't, if you don't make the sale on the floor at that time and they say, okay, well, I'll think about it and I'll come back. Um, this is why there's like high pressure of like, oh, well, I can do this too. Oh, when I can do this too is because 95% of the time they don't come back. And so, you know, you need to, you need to make yourself, you need to make your sale right then and there. Um, so the vast majority of my patients that do just fine doing that. Very few of them get gut dysbi dysbiosis. And when they do, it's like a couple of weeks of runny stools and then, then it goes away. Um, that's been my experience with that anyway. And, um, uh, and so I, I think that it's, it is safe for people to do that. Um, but if you want to be you know, careful about it, you do that in a stepwise progression like that. Ariana Eshun, thank you for the super chat. Uh, carnivore 95% plus for one year. Macros right now are 132 grams of protein, 80 grams of fat, less than 10, 10 grams of carbs. 
Stools are very, very loose. Butter eaters confound me. Not my goal, but please explain uh, fat adaptation. Well, it, it matters what else you're eating. You know what else is in that five percent. If you're having if you're having coffee, tea, any any non-sugar sweeteners, any magnesium supplements, and multiple medications such as metformin and others, all cause loose stools, especially on a carnivore diet when you're not eating a whole bunch of fiber. So that can contribute, that can add to it. Um, also, people seem to think that you have to have just a bucket load of salt with everything that you eat or drink. That is not the case. The, I've definitely seen people get loose stools from uh, adding way too much salt and putting in just like tons of salt in their water and drinking that. That's that's a known way of doing a flush, a gastric fl uh, or a colonic flush. You drink a whole bunch of salt water and you just get this, you just pull out all this moisture out of your intestines and you just have uh, loose stools. So if you're drinking, if you're just using way too much salt and drinking really salty water, you're going to get loose stools. Um, so it depends. It depends on what you're doing. If you are only eating uh, meat and only drinking water, no supplements, no nothing, anything else, and you're still getting loose stools, they're very, very loose. Like you say, you could be so constipated that you're getting overflow diarrhea, that you're having a blockage and you're getting liquid stools around it and you have liquid stools all the time. And then every now and then you get this boulder that comes out and then you're back to liquid stools. That's called overflow diarrhea or spurious diarrhea. And that means you need way more fat than what you're doing. Um, if that's not the case and you're just getting liquidy stools, it could be that you're eating too much fat, but at, at 80, 132, you're not. You're, you're really on the underside of that. So I would I would actually bet that you're probably getting the, the overflow diarrhea if you're not eating all these other things. If you're having coffee and all that other sort of stuff, um, then that's probably what it is when you don't have a bunch of fiber there to block up the pipes. Things just go faster, right? Um, you know, so it's... Um, you know, it's, it's very possible to get to get loose stools very easily when you when you add it, even if you're having the same amount of coffee as you always did. Well, now you're not having the same amount of fiber as you always did. And that's the difference. So at 80 grams of fat, I would bet if everything else being equal, and you're only eating fat and you're only eating meat. I mean, um, and you're not doing a whole bunch of salt and craziness like that or having coffee or artificial sweeteners or magnesium supplements or you know, artificial sweeteners and metformin and all these other sorts of things. If you're not doing that, then I would say you're not eating enough fat. I would bet that that's what's going on and that you're actually very constipated. You probably every now and then get this rocky boulder that comes out and then it's liquid otherwise. And if that's the pattern, you need a lot more fat. And if you're eating anything else besides or having anything else besides meat, you need to drop it. And you just see what's happening. If you're if you're eating those things and you're getting loose stools and you drop it, now you drop it's rock hard. That's what it was, and um, so that that's what I would do there. So de definitely, um, definitely try that. So Mona Shabir, thank you very much for the super chat. Dr. Chafee, I'm 40 years old and just started carnivore. I'm 160 pounds. It's eating one pound of ribeye plus a tablespoon, one tablespoon of, I'm assuming, butter, fat, ghee, aloe, something. Um, is that enough? I'm not hungry after. It's not about being hungry. It's about going until it stops tasting good because your hunger signals are going to change. And so you need to relearn them. So you eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. If fatty meat tastes good and you're not eating anything else, then you can listen to your hunger signals. And so you keep eating until it stops tasting good, until you get a bite that goes like, hmm, it's just sort of bland and uninteresting. I don't really want to eat that anymore. That's when you stop. If it still tastes interesting on your last bite, you make another, you make some more food. Uh, so that's what you do. So a pound of ribeye could be enough, but maybe it's not. You need to eat until it stops tasting good and then uh, and then you'll be fine. Um, there's a question from Linda on Facebook. My husband stopped his nightly drinking after going ketovore. Why does this help? Well, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, we, we, sometimes we drink because we have these sort of compulsions that we're missing and, and, uh, issues with dopamine 
diet fixes that. So you don't have to self-medicate anymore. You feel good. Also, there are studies with ketogenic diets and people that are getting detox from alcohol. And, uh, but this is in the hospital. So these are, these are, you know, career alcoholics that are having severe withdrawals. They need to be in the hospital while they're withdrawing. And, um, they found that not only did they subjectively improve and say that they didn't have as many cravings and felt better coming off of it, but objectively they required less benzodiazepines and, and medication to keep them out of, uh, the DTs. So, you know, the, you know, a lot of people that turn to these sorts of things because, you know, their, their brain chemistry isn't quite working right. And they just feel a lot better when they drink and then they feel a lot better just on the, on their own and they don't need to drink. So that can be something there. And that's great. It sounds really, really, well, it is really good that, that he's drinking less and not drinking as much and, uh, and doing better, hopefully in other respects as well. Ariana, I shouldn't thank you so much for the, the next super chat. Uh, I think I'm okay. Uh, but please comment labs from March, uh, 23. Um, Cholesterol is 7.2, triglycerides 1.1, HDL 1.6, LDLC uh, 5.1, ratio is what it is. HbA1c is 5.2, uh, new bloods due Monday. Those all look great. Um, if you go back to my 15-minute <laughs> rant on, um, on cholesterol and everything like that, you'll see this is just not something to be worried about. We just need to stop talking about it. I don't check cholesterol in my patients because it's, it's a waste of time and money. The only thing I'll be looking for is high triglyceride or sorry, high LDL, sorry, high HDL, also high LDL and low triglyceride. That's what I care about. Um, and I also don't care because if you are eating a carnivore diet, if you're eating what you're supposed to be, that's what you're going to have. You're going to have high or low or normal or abnormal according to who, uh, LDL. Um, but it's going to be physiological. So that's actually going to be normal. It may not be the norm, but it will be normal for your physiology and your body. And so I just don't, I just don't uh, concern myself with, um, with cholesterol. HbA1c is another matter and that's very good. 5.2. That's great. So that's what you want. If you have diabetes, if you have elevated HbA1c, you're going to increase your, your risk of cardiovascular disease. You just will. So, um, so, you know, that's, that's a much more beneficial and important marker than any of the cholesterol markers. It's a much, much more predict. It's much more predictive of developing heart disease than any of your cholesterol. Uh, even going through the LDL subfractions, um, even just having you know pattern B SDLDL dominant LDL only increases your risk of developing cardiovascular disease by 1.7 X or type two diabetes is 10 X, right? A thousand percent increased risk. And metabolic syndrome is 600% increased risk. And the things that you do to reverse diabetes and metabolic syndrome also get rid of your SDLDL as well. So it all comes part and parcel. Don't waste your time with, with cholesterol. H, um, HbA1c, sure. Fasting insulin, yes. Fasting blood sugar, yes. Um, and other signs of metabolic syndrome. Now, your HDL and triglycerides give you, give you a picture of um, your metabolic state and metabolic syndrome. So that's important in that context, literally no other context I really care about, except I want you, I want to have higher cholesterol. I want to have higher LDL because that's what the studies show is beneficial. People that have higher cholesterol have less heart attacks and strokes, according to the Framingham study. People that have higher LDL cholesterol live longer. People that have higher total cholesterol and lower fasting insulin are more likely to live over 100. So good job. Those all look good. So Oaktown Girl says, I am pissed off. I've learned so much from you, Dr. Chafee. Don't ever stop. I'm spreading the word too. I'm pissed too. It's like it really bothers me. And that that whole rant about me being pissed off, maybe that's a good clip that we can we can cut off and put as a discreet thing because it just it just pisses me off. And you know, more people should be pissed off about this as well. Frederick Williamson, thank you for the super chat. Um, how should prednisone be handled for autoimmune while on carnivore? I feel like prednisone can keep carnivore diet from working as well. Yeah, well, look, it, it'll it'll raise your blood sugar. It mimics cortisol. That's the whole point. 
Um, and, it, and uh, yeah, it was just basically <laughs> give you diabetes. But um, if you need it at the moment, then, you know, you need it at the moment and then you get off of it as soon as you can. You put the carnivore diet in place so that you're on, you're, you're getting rid of the underlying mechanism so that, you know, you can, you can come off the steroids. No one should be on prednisone long-term. That should be a short-term course. If they have you on prednisone just for life, get a new doctor. Like just that, that there are extremely limited scenarios where that is appropriate. And, um, and so generally these are short-term courses, but for things like Crohn's disease, that has been shown that elemental diet like a uh, carnivore diet would be because you're just getting the, the, the elemental nutrition that you need and nothing else. An elemental diet, you know, they use shakes uh, for these experiments, um, is a better treatment for an acute flare up of Crohn's than prednisone, right? So just not eating certain things is a better treatment than steroids, right? So don't eat the wrong things and you should be fine. Um, but, you know, if you're on a course of prednisone, you know, finish the course and, and wean off uh, as per your doctor, because you do need to wean off these things in a, in a, you know, measured respect, or you can have problems. Um, and then get off and stay off because hopefully you, you won't have uh, flare ups anymore that you need prednisone after that. Um, and if you're on long-term prednisone, you need to talk to your doctor or another doctor who has your best interest at heart uh, about getting the hell off of that, because that's not what you want long-term. Steve, thank you for the super chat. Hey, Doc, thanks for all the great content. Is carnivore bad for someone with early stage prostate cancer, uh, but is not in treatment of any kind? Cheers. Well, you know, any any sort of cancer, I think uh, I, I personally would recommend and do personally ketogenic metabolic therapy, which is, you know, getting your blood sugar uh, nice and low and your, and your ketones nice and high. And this has been shown in, in, in preclinical and clinical studies to improve outcomes, improve cancer outcomes for various different kinds of cancer. Prostate cancer um, is, I think, even, and prostate issues, again, are largely um, sensitive to like in, insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance, and so on. So, you know, any sort of cancer, I would be very, very aggressive with ketogenic metabolic therapy, getting my GKI down, the glucose ketone index down below two or one with, you know, limited food in carnivore diet of limited food intake, very high fat, two grams of fat to one gram of protein. So 80% calories from fat, 20 from protein and organs, because if you're eating less, you need more nutrients. You need more of these micronutrients because you're just, you, you, it's, it's calorie restricted ketogenic diets have always been shown to be, uh, the best outcome on ketogenic metabolic uh, therapy. So you limit the amount of, that you eat, but obviously you need the, these nutrients. So you need more organs in there as well. Right. And, um, and th if that's not enough to get your GKI below two, uh, on average for the week, then, you know, you have periods of fasting as well. So that's what I would do. I would be pretty aggressive with that sort of thing. I wouldn't, F around. I mean, I don't F around now. I mean, I, probably my GK is pretty in that, in that, um, that, you know, that, that, uh, therapeutic range always, you know, but I would make sure if I, if I had cancer and I would probably just eat once a day and, uh, to try to keep that, that GK nice and low, that's what I would do. And, um, uh, you know, you don't have to be on treatment. Some of these things, you know, the, you know, some of these things are very slow growing and there's something like sometimes people die with prostate cancer as opposed to from prostate cancer, but people die from prostate cancer too. So, you know, it can metastasize to your, your spine and, and other parts of your body. You know, it, uh, it's, it's not something you want to mess around with. So, you know, I would personally treat myself with ketogenic metabolic th therapy, even if the doctor doesn't think that it's, it's, uh, necessary to do any other interventions. Yeah. I would just do that anyway. Julie R. Thank you for the super chat. Hi, Dr. Chafee. My son is 15, uh, HDL 42 triglycerides 106. He is a competitive athlete. Would you recommend carnivore at his age? Appreciate all you do. I, I would recommend 
carnivore diet for everyone at every age and every medical condition and situation, because that's the optimal diet for, for human beings, but especially for uh, kids growing up, they're still developing, they need proper, perfect nutrition, or they're not going to develop to their genetic potential. They're not going to be as tall. He's not going to be as tall. He's not going to be have as big of a brain as well-developed neurological uh, um, system. And uh, he's not going to be athletic. He's not going to have the same athletic performance. Um, so yes, I would absolutely say, especially because he's a, a competitive young athlete, that this is very important for him to get on. He'll have a massive advantage over all of his competition and um, and will be able to train harder and longer and get more out of it than everyone else and be able to play harder and train and, and then just absolutely kill it. So I know this because I did this as a professional athlete for five years and I have never in my life performed or felt better. And, um, and I know many, many, many international athletes, people going to the Olympics, people playing professional rugby, international rugby, uh, that do this now and do carnivore. And they're like, I have never felt better in my entire life. And, um, and, uh, and other former pro athletes that are like, where the hell was this when I played? I, I feel better now in my late forties than I did in my twenties, you know, playing for the, you know, the wallabies, the, the Australian, um, uh, international, um, rugby team. So in fact, I'm, I may be inter interviewing, uh, one of these guys that that was a, a former wallaby and is doing carnivore now and just feels like a superhero because you do. So doing this at his age, he's going to get even more benefits. He's going to grow taller. He's going to grow stronger. He's going to have a, a healthier bone density. He's going to have a bigger brain and more developed neurological um, uh, structures in his body. And so he's going to be more dynamic, athletic, fast, uh, and and um, and uh, agile. You know, so yes, I definitely would recommend it for him and his HDL will go up and his triglycerides will come down and he'll do great. And, you know, let us know, let us know how that goes. If he tries it, how does he do? I mean, look at this way. I, I, I've got, I've got pro athletes that I, that I've uh, helped and they've gone carnivore and they double their testosterone at 25, you know, as a professional athlete, you know what I mean? no medications and they get tested because like, oh, well, that's a big jump. And the league goes, okay. Or the NCAA goes, oh, okay, let's check it out. And they check their, their other hormones like their FH and LH, FSH and LH, and they're in perfect balance. They're like, oh yeah, this is just your body doing this. Hmm. Good job. And um, what's that going to do to a 15 year old? I had a 19 year old kid. His testosterone was that of an 85 year old sick man, right? He goes carnivore for two months and it triples right? So this is going to dramatically improve your son's health and, and life in general, and certainly his athletic performance, but his health and his longevity. And um, so I would definitely encourage him to do that. Um, if he does, let us know how we, how, how he's doing. And, um, you know, you know, let us know in the chats or on, on something somewhere, <laughs> let us know how he does. Uh, Red Top Rich, thank you for the super chat. Been off and on keto for the last two years, uh, 14 days online diet and attempt. Um, this time I'm locked in and feel great. Thanks for all you do and the videos. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And you're very welcome. And I, I'm glad that you're giving it a try. I mean, you know, just, you know, keto is going to be doing good things for your body and you're going to get less of the crap and more of the meat and the fat that you need. And line diets, you know, probably the best of all. So, um, good job with that. And, uh, I hope you're feeling good and, um, and that you just keep getting better. The longer you go, the better you feel. You have multi months, you have four times the number of mitochondria, they're four times effective after two years, you have even more and they work better, you know, all these different autophagy and, uh, and processes and turning on stem cells. I and mean, you literally age backwards and your hormones all optimize. So it's, it's an amazing experience and I'm really excited for you because you're just getting into that really amazing phase now after 14 days you're going to start feeling like a superhero and uh that's that's uh, that's always good to see the carnivore odyssey thank you so much for the super chat good to see you uh hey doc i'm coming out of a cold that lasted three weeks i'm sorry to hear that i stood my ground and kept eating meat man it was hard 19 kgs gone since january 1st great job that's really great 
Um, well, look, it, it probably wasn't a cold. Let's be realistic. You know, the colds just, just don't, they just, they just bounce off the armor at this point. But, uh, so it was probably like a bad flu or something like that, that just sort of felt more like a cold that didn't go away because your immune system is stronger. But, you know, also remember that, that stress and poor sleep can definitely damage your immune system and make it so that, you know, you, you are more susceptible to these sorts of, uh, issues. And, uh, and you can get sick, unfortunately. So, uh, you know, do take care of yourself, get plenty of sleep, plenty of rest, plenty of water, and try not to be um, stressed out as much as you can. And uh, hopefully that's the last, last uh, illness that you see for a long time. Uh, Kenneth uh, Mathena, a uh, very kind comment, says, Hi, Dr. Chafee, you're totally awesome. Uh, thank you so much for helping so many people all over the world. Well, you're very welcome, and thank you very much for your comment. That's very kind of you. Dark Sky, thank you for the super chat. Bart K says that we should continually be continually cycling in and out of keto ketosis when we eat enough protein uh, to get a necessary bump of insulin thoughts. What he's saying is that you do that and not that you have to do that or you have to orchestrate it in some fashion, that that's just naturally what happens. And so if you're just eating a lot of meat, you're eating like a big bolus of meat in one go, that that will happen. Um, and that that's, and that's, and that covers everything because people do say like, Ooh, you need to have your, you need to have a fluctuation of your insulin. And that may or may not be true. But what, what professor K is uh, pointing out is that that happens anyway. And so you don't need to eat carbs in order to get that insulin cycle. So that's the point that, that he's making. Um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm on board, you know, whatever happens when we eat a whole bunch of meat and only meat is what's supposed to happen. So if we're in and out of ketosis for, if our insulin goes up or down, that's what's supposed to happen. That's, that's the, the underlying message here. That's the, that's the core principle of our biology is that we have been eating meat in exclusion for much of our existence as humans and pre-humans. And so our, our biology is set up for that. And so if we're eating just meat and we're eating until our, and we're eating the, the amount that our bodies want and need then our body's going to do what it's supposed to do. And if we are in and out of ketosis, then we're in and out of, in, in or out of ketosis. Fine, whatever. Um, it's neither here nor there, you know, it's just, it just is what it is. And so, yeah, absolutely. Like, um, you know, so your body may do that, but what, what, uh, Bart was saying was it, it's not that, Oh, you need to do this. This is important for you to do that. Um, he was countering, uh, Dr. Saladino's contention that you have to eat carbs in order to, you know, upcycle your insulin because your insulin has to go up to do certain things. And he's saying, no, you don't have to do that because when you just eat a whole bunch of meat, your insulin goes up anyway. And you come out of ketosis transiently and you come back into it. And so he's saying that that's, that that happens anyway. Um, and, uh, either way it's, it's supposed to happen. Whatever is happening, it's supposed to happen because this is how we're made. Uh, Swisha the Fisher. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the super chat. Looks like it didn't get added on. It looks like there's one down here. Um, uh, thank you for the super chat again. Um, Swisha says, thank you for taking us out of the matrix through food. Uh, so much of the world is so stuck and, uh, this is a great start. Thank you for your time, doc. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And it does feel like the, it does feel like the matrix, doesn't it? Uh, they were just locked into this whole strange fantasy that doesn't line up with the, with what we see on a daily basis and people say, no, 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 don't believe your own eyes. Don't believe the fact that you're getting better and getting healthier and everyone else is getting fatter and sicker and you're not, you're the one that's sick. I mean, it's, it's gaslighting on a, on a global scale. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very easy to spot the bullshit. And, uh, when you start spotting it, you start getting really good at spotting it and you start seeing it more and more and more, uh, which is why a lot of people are coming to carnivore from all different, aspects and they spot some nonsense over here and they go like okay what else are they lying about and they start digging into it and they find like oh shit and now we're not even supposed to eat kellogg cereals god damn it you know like okay so you know uh it's um just more and more people are are waking up thankfully and, and taking the red pill and and um you know hopefully we can just keep this trend going i mean the cat's out of the bag at this point you know they can't just they can't just i mean they can silence me but you know my videos are out there they're all on rumble, you know, all of these go to rumble automatically. So 
that's permanent and I've got them all. So they, they take my YouTube channel down, I'll just put them up somewhere else. Um, but the information is out there. I mean, it's just so widespread now. And I, and my interviews on other people's channels are all over the place too. They're not going to take all these things down. There's too much. And there's too many people. Even if, if I'm gone, the, the information is out there now and people know what to look for. And so, you know, more and more people have more and more channels. So, you know, someone says like a game of whack-a-mole, like <laughs> you're not going to get all of us. And um, they might try, I mean, you know, but I think cat's out of the bag. I mean, enough people know people personally that are doing this and having a great result that it's just going to continue by word of mouth. And so, you know, I think we're in a good position at the moment to, to um, get people healthy and, um, and, and get away from this, this uh, weird, weird stage of humanity and existence where we've been completely screwed over and, uh, and hurt extensively. Um, and our families have been hurt and our parents and grandparents have all gotten sick and died too young. And that's really, 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 really anchors me. Um, so that's why I do it. So you're very welcome. Thank you very much for your support. I'm more than happy to do this because it is important to, and it pisses me off. So that's why I do it. Ed Boxer one. Thank you for the super chat. Hello, I have been feeling tired. Does that mean I have to consume more fat? Given that I work out twice a day, uh, weightlifting and boxing. So there are a lot of reasons why someone can be uh, tired on a carnivore diet. Um, if you only sort of come to a carnivore diet more recently, your body may take longer to adapt. You, you can, you know, full keto adaption can take a while. Sometimes you usually for performance uh, purposes, usually in a couple of weeks, you just feel fantastic. And, uh, but some people, you know, full adaptation is going to take months. Um, but for, for like, you, you shouldn't see a real dip in your, in your, um, in your energy levels after a couple of weeks anyway. But as far as, um, getting tired goes, if, you, if you've been on it for a long time, you're sort of getting tired. If you're eating before, uh, you're working out, you're going to be tired. You're gonna have a terrible workout. So always eat after your workouts, your last workouts. So if you train in the morning, you can eat something after that. And, but then you need a big, long five, six, seven hour break in between eating, um, before your, your next workout, you know, or else you're just going to have a crappy workout. And, um, if you're not eating enough, if you're not eating enough fat, yeah, definitely that can, that can, uh, drag you down a bit. If you're not getting enough water that can drag you down a bit. Um, there's a lot of different things. I did do a video on, uh, you know, getting tired on a carnivore diet. And uh, that's pretty quick. It's like nine minutes long or something like that. And it sort of goes through most, those are, those are the main ones. Um, and uh, you can sort of troubleshoot those and just sort of go down the list. And, um, you know, if you sort of troubleshoot all these sorts of things and, and that's not enough, uh, you just give it time, you know, and, uh, and see how you go. But, but eating at the wrong time is, is definitely something that can, um, that can get you tired. Yeah. And not eating enough. So uh, set an egg. Thank you for the super chat. 30 years alcoholic. Want to do carnivore more than anything, but haven't had appetite or taste for three years. Force everything down. Uh, any advice? Yeah, just just do that. But what you force down is you force down fatty meat. And you try to start weaning yourself off, off the alcohol. And usually on a, in a state of ketosis, on a ketogenic state, that can be easier. You know, I mentioned those studies before. If you've been a 30 year alcoholic, you may actually need medical support to, to come off of that. Um, and so, you know, do talk to your doctor about that. And, you know, if you're getting shaky and jittery, you know, you might, you might need help, you know, you might need B vitamins and thiamine and, and, uh, B12 and other sorts of things uh, to support you, or even, you know, things like Librium and, and benzodiazepines that, that, uh, will settle down the shakes and um and help you get through the dts but a carnivore diet can help that too um and you can always slowly wean off and uh, and you shouldn't have those withdrawals um but yeah i would i would definitely when you eat you only eat fatty meat that's it or eggs that's it and um and you just you do try to eat at least once a day and you try to get something down you know and um and, uh, and you just sort of try to try to build that up and build that up and reduce the alcohol, but you just cut out everything else. You just cut out everything else and only eat meat. And, um, 
you know, and then just try to build up your appetite again. It'll, it'll come. It'll definitely come, especially when you're getting away from everything else and eating really good fatty meat, your body will start looking at that and going, Ooh, yep, that's what we need. And, um, yeah, they can definitely help talk to your doctor about different sorts of B vitamins and different things you may be missing or depleting from your body because of the alcohol. Uh, thiamine is a, a major one and you can get like Wernicke's, um, encephalopathy, um, and which is permanent, you know, and then, so you don't, you don't want that to even begin, um, or can be permanent anyway, but, um, yeah, well, good luck with that. Um, and just when you eat, just eat fatty meat and do try to eat every day, get something down and, um, and, and start, start building, building up and weaning down off the, off the alcohol and hopefully, hopefully you get there. Uh, Salio 1985. Thank you for the super chat. My leukemia doctor said leukemia feeds on, um, asparagine. Meat is high in this amino acid, according to uh, an asparagine calculator. What are your thoughts? Um, not that I know of, that uh, leukemia feeds on glucose and glutamine. Meat does have glutamine, but so do plants. You know, um, you're not going to avoid glutamine because of that. Um, cancers, uh, period, feed on glucose and glutamine. Not asparagine, from my understanding. Um, but either way, I mean, you're, 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 um, well, it's, it's, it's good that they're, you're, they're, your oncologist is at least thinking about food. Um, I, I like that, but, um, no, you're, 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 you shouldn't avoid meat. I mean, you have these amino acids that are in plants anyway, like glutamine. Um, and so, you know, how do you avoid glutamine? Well, you don't really, because you make glutamine and, um, and so it's uh, it's not really possible to avoid it. You know, if you cook these things, glutamine cooks out; it denatures. So you can do that. But um, really, what what it comes down to is disrupting glutamine metabolism or fasting. You know, if you fast, you're going to limit the amount of glucose and glutamine that get in your body, and aspergine that gets in your body, and you're going to limit the amount of, of available energy fuel sources for your cancer cells. And I. You know, that's news to me about the aspergine. Um, you know, I haven't, I haven't uh, heard that. It's certainly not something that uh, I've come across before. I'd be interested to see where, where he got that from or she. Um, but it's great that they're thinking about that. Maybe, maybe show them my interview with Professor Thomas Seafried and show them his work on glutamine and glucose feeding cancer cells. And, uh, and, and if he's willing to sort of address things in that regard, you know, depending on your leukemia, it may be more glycolytic or maybe more reliant on glutamine. And if it is more um, reliant on glutamine, you know, would your your doctor be willing to put you on something like Dawn, uh, D-O-N? It's, um, you know, can't recall the whole chemical name at the moment, but um, it's in that video anyway. And um, uh, that was actually originally... Um, prescribed for leukemia and lymphoma patient, one or the other, uh, in any case, so it may actually be very well, uh, very possible for you to get that. So a lot of other people with cancers are desperately trying to get their hands on this stuff because things like GBM are, are, you know, they, they, they have like 75% of their energy comes from glutamine. So you really do do much better disrupting the glutamine. And there are other things that disrupt glutamine, uh, that have been published on such as, uh, fenbendazole and medbendazole, but you know, you need to work with your doctor if that's, if that's right with you and you have someone who treats leukemia and Dawn is a leukemia drug, I believe that or lymphoma. So maybe that you can get these sorts of things and you attack it with ketogenic metabolic therapy, as well as something like Dawn or similar, and you, um, you know, do the requisite chemo, um, or, or radiation as per your, your oncologist and your, your decision with the team. Um, and, and hopefully that gives you a very good result and outcome, but, uh, never heard of aspergine being a problem. Um, but fasting does the exact same thing either way. And, um, I think the same thing is, is true, uh, regardless is that you approach this in that ketogenic metabolic therapy, which is, that's where the clinical data and preclinical data comes from showing that this improves cancer outcomes, uh, in humans and animals by, you know, stopping the carbs, limiting the amount of food coming in 
and uh, disrupting glutamine. Nadrasima, thank you very much for the very generous super chat. It's very kind of you. Um, they say, thank you so much for your content. It changed my life. Beef makes me feel like a superhuman. I just eat steak and raw cow's milk. Are the carbs from the milk going to wreck my weight loss long term? I have three to four cups a day, uh, 36 to 48 grams of carbohydrates. Well, first of all, you're very, very welcome. And I'm really glad that um, it has been helpful. Um, I personally do avoid milk even raw milk, even though it's bloody delicious. Uh, you know, it's part, partly why I avoid it because it's, I sort of feel compelled to drink it. And there's that sort of compulsion. I'm like, I want this. Right. And so that to me is a drug. I don't want that. Right. So I don't want to be compelled to eat something. I want something that has negative feedback. When I eat more fatty meat, it tastes good at first, but it tastes less good and less good and less good until finally it doesn't taste good at all. Milk always tastes good. I mean, I, I just dump down two gallons of that stuff a day and I, I would drink more if there was there and I didn't feel like I shouldn't, you know, um, but I would, you know, I mean, I grew up drinking a gallon of milk every day growing up. It was skim milk, unfortunately, and it was pasteurized, unfortunately, but it, um, you know, that that's what I did yeah, as a kid, you know, as, as an adult, I drink more than that sometimes i just chug this stuff down i would have my own bottle of milk in the fridge and i just i would just i would just drink out because i'd finished a gallon a day right and so um i do avoid carbs now or the milk now because of the carbs and um you know i, I drink a glass of milk and i'm you know what once every year or two i'll get my hands on some raw milk or something like that and i'll just be like oh okay you know um have some of that and i have a glass and it's just amazing. And I'll sit down on the couch and like an hour later, I'm like passing out on the couch in the middle of the day, you know, it raises your insulin and then you get reactive hypoglycemia and you just little, and you pass out. So, uh, that can, you know, that can happen. And then I found myself, okay, well, I'm sort of getting a bit tired and my, well, I really want another glass. Okay. I'll have another glass. And an hour later, oh, I want another glass. So I'll have another glass. And I just do that throughout the day. And then I'm, I'm chasing carbs. You know, you're, you're down that rabbit hole again of you just you're getting carbs and it comes down. You want to get more carbs and it comes down. And so it's that thing. So I'm, I'm just I'm just out of that rat race. And um, and so that's why I do that. So, you know, just do an experiment, you know, drop the milk for a month. See how you feel. You know, I think you'll feel better. You know, I think you'll do better. I think you'll have more consistent energy throughout the day. And um, and I think you'll get get better uh, fat loss as a result of that as well. Dairy is a huge, um, fat loss stall. And, uh, while it's extremely nutritious and if people are, are nutritionally deprived or they have a nutritionally de deficient diet, raw milk and liver are your best friends, right? Because they're very nutrient dense and you can, you can catch up on a lot of things. It's like, this, this is like the, it's nature's supplement. And, um, so that's great. But if you're already eating a top-notch diet, then you don't, you don't necessarily need it because you're getting all those nutrients already. Uh, so those are sort of my thoughts on it. If you feel that that's of benefit to you, then great. But, you know, try it and see the contrast and see see how you go and what you think and what works best for your body. Bruh. Thanks for the super chat. Thanks, bruh. Uh, hey, Chafee. I am... 136 kg dude who's uh, going to the gym a lot. I just started sprinting last week. Awesome. I just wondered what ratio of grams between fat and protein I should have normally at 50, 50, uh, you know, that's fairly good, you know, and, and if you're working out a lot, you may need, a, well, you will need a bit more amino acids and things like that for muscle uh, growth and hypertrophy. Um, so I, I still think you, you listen to your body, you try to get enough fat that you that so the thing is it's not really about the ratio it's more about you need enough fat and you need enough protein for your body uh body's demands and so you need enough fat so that you're not getting constipated if you're getting constipated you're not eating enough fat so however much fat you have if you're eating two to one grams of fat to protein and you're getting constipated you're not eating enough fat you still need to eat more um maybe you need to eat more protein too but you definitely need to eat more fat as well and so you eat fat until you have soft stools. As long as you're not eating anything else than drinking anything else or subjecting yourself to anything else like a medicine or a supplement that can cause diarrhea or, or loosening of the stools and quickening of the bowels. Um, and then you just eat, you eat 
fatty meat until it stops tasting good and you add in butter and it tastes better, go for it. You know, if you finish that steak and it's like, oh, that was still tasting good, eat more. And um, and if you're eating more lean meat, you you it gets boring pretty quick. You add butter to it, tastes good again, and you go for it. You just eat a piece of butter, and that's really good. That's a good sign that your body wants more of it. Um, and the, and the constipation thing is a big one. Um, quite often, one to one grams of fat to protein to two to one grams of fat to protein is where people balance out, and it depends on the person, the individual. You might need a little bit more of one or the other. And so that ratio might change a bit, but it's not as important about the ratio as getting enough grams of each. That's what you need. You just need enough of these things. And generally, people need more grams of fat than they need grams of protein. That's how that usually usually tends to run. But just you know, do it, listen to your body. You're sort of in that range anyway. Now just adjust to your body's demands and, and specifically their fat content to your stools. And um, if you're taking a whole bunch of protein powders because you're in the gym a lot, I probably wouldn't. And I especially wouldn't if they have artificial sweeteners because they'll cause loose stools and uh, other sorts of problems, disruption. They could disrupt your insulin. And um, yeah, so I, I would cut all those things out. So all things being even, you're only eating meat and uh, only drinking water. Um, then you just adjust uh, according to your body. And if you're eating anything else, drop it. Momentum fourth. Um, thank you for the super chat. I, I'm not seeing a question attached. I'm not seeing one below. So um, I don't know, but thank you very much in any case. And then um, Sakya Guy <laughs> uh, <laughs> says, uh, bro, so much respect. Uh, you're you're a good person, uh, planet. Uh, planet's better because you're here. Oh, well, thank you very much. That's really nice of you to say. Um, that's very kind of you. Um, okay. Well, I think that that might do it. I think we got through the super chats pretty well. And, um, and, uh, and we went a bit over time, but that, that's okay. So, um, yeah. So if you see here, everyone, this is the, uh, we're having a regenerate health summit that's coming up on April 21st. So I'll be speaking there. Uh, there'll be a number of other people speaking there, um, that are you know, absolutely fantastic. So my friend Natalie West will be there. Um, um, Charles Arnott will be there of, of like Arnott's, um, crackers and things like that, you know, big brand here. And he's a big regenerative farmer, uh, here in Australia. So he, um, he's going to be talking there and, um, uh, and a number of other people, um, that are, that are going to be great to listen to as well. So if you guys want to go there, you can go to the regenerate oz.com. So regenerate aus.com. Um, there's a link in the chat as it says there, or you, you see this sort of thing up on the screen and, um, and, uh, that, and tickets are still available, but they they are, they are, uh, you know, selling out. So you know, if you do want to go to that, please do. And, um, and, uh, I will see you guys there. So it'll be, it'd be a really fun time. We had a great time last year. It was perfect. The food was amazing. It was all just super carnivore stuff. Just amazing, amazing, like regenerative farmed meat and uh, high fat and just great. It was awesome. A bunch of brisket and, and, uh, different sorts of, um, meat dish. Like literally my mouth is watering right now thinking about it. It was like the best spread at a, um, at a conference that I, I had been to, um, uh, so far. And so hopefully we can, hopefully we can do again, uh, uh, as well this time as well. Um, all right. So if you want to check that out, please do go to that link. Um, and we're sort of halfway through our month of, of March on our how to carnivore challenge group. Uh, people want to sign up for April. They can, they can do that at any time. So you can sign up now and get ready for the April 1st start. And, uh, so obviously just right after the, the Easter weekend. And, uh, and if people want to join me on Patreon, I have, uh, active, um, Q and a sessions just for Patreon members twice a week now, uh, depending on the tier. So tier two, we have, uh, once a week, uh, question and answer session where people will submit pre-submit questions. And then once a week, we just added in a uh, tier three question at more one-on-one -on -one where everyone joins on zoom and we all have more of a, of a face-to-face -face chat and talk. If that's uh, interested, 
interest people. So if you guys want to join me over there, uh, my Patreon is just Anthony Chafee MD, just like my YouTube channel. And um, I put out all my content early, just sort of right away. When I have interviews, I just pop them up so people see them you know, pretty much straight away. And, um, and hopefully, and then we have a really live and active discord group, uh, as well, the community there where everyone gets to talk to each other. And we have, you know, you know, hundred, a few hundred people on there now, and everyone's very active and very friendly and it's a very supportive, uh, n- uh, you know, community where everyone's been, been really nice and helping each other succeed and be as healthy as they can be. So if anyone wants to join that, they can, they can join there as well. And um, either way, I'll see you guys on my Monday, your Sunday, American Sunday, for um, for my next premiere. And I'm doing two premieres a week now. I'm going to be doing those live premieres on at uh, in the morning, usually 9 a.m. in the morning, on my Monday and Thursdays um, for new premieres because I've got I've got a number of episodes in backlog that I need to that I need to get out, and uh, so people aren't waiting too long to see these things and get them published. So I'll be doing them two, twice a week for the moment, and then two lives a week on Wednesdays and Fridays. And um, so lots of stuff, lots of content, and hopefully see you all at the premieres. It's really great to get a lot of people at the lives. So thank you all for joining. Sorry for the delays today uh, and to the premieres as well. That really makes a big difference in getting these things out there uh, because the more people that come to the premiere, the more people are commenting and, and being active in it, the more this pumps it out on the algorithm and it gets uh, just better and better and better exposure. So that's really helpful. So thank you all very much for that. Hopefully you all can join me uh, for the next, uh, well, for all the premieres and all the lives. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. Take care. uh, And I will see you next time. See you on the uh, premiere on Monday, Sunday in the U S thanks everyone. Have a good weekend.